Okay, thanks everyone for uh, coming to uh, Linux Plumbers 2019. Uh, before we go, we have a few things we want to uh, cover. First of all, we have to thank our sponsors. Uh, big thank you for Facebook as our diamond sponsor. Uh, without our sponsors, this would not happen. Uh, Linux Plumbers is an extremely, um, uh, how do you say, very important conference to get things done. And a lot of corporations realize this. So thanks, Di uh, Facebook, our platinum sponsors, Intel, Google, NetApp, uh, Gold, Arm, Dell EMC, Microsoft Azure, Azure sorry, Western Digital, um, Silver is DigitalOcean, Netflix, uh, National Gnome, Oracle, uh, the Catchbacks, these guys, uh, Collabora, Col uh, Collabora, sorry, I horrible with uh, pronunciations. Uh, the lunch sponsored by IBM, T-shirts, VMware, and the evening events will be Google. So please just give a round of applause. Um, everyone, if you haven't know, you know, we have uh, the Wi-Fi, uh, SSID, LF events, uh, password Linux 1991. Uh, we do have a code of conduct. We are very strict. We will be abiding by it. Uh, please read it. If you have any issues, look for someone with one of these green lanyards. Uh, we are the planning committee. Uh, come up to uh, talk to us. Uh, we will uh, make sure it's handled properly. Um, schedule overview, Linux Comps event timetable. You can go through, look for you. Just go to Linux Comps. You'll find a link for the schedule. Um, as you know, morning session start at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, lunch. Uh, if you've noticed, there's no breakfast. That's because the conference hotel provides a really nice breakfast, so we tried to encourage uh, lunch. So it's either our choice was we either have a breakfast and no lunch, but having the conference hotel have breakfast, we figured let's have a lunch. So lunch is provided down at the uh, restaurant downstairs from 1.30 to 3. Uh, evening events, uh, we have something tonight with a reception. It'll be the uh, same place where lunch is at, from 7 to 9. Uh, Tuesday night, you're on your own. Uh, the second half of the microconferences will be, uh, on Tuesday night, will be extended conferences because there's no evening events. Uh, Wednesday night event after plenary, buses will start at 7.30. We'll talk more about that at the closing uh, plenary session. Um, okay, make sure everyone uploads your slides to the LPC site. Hopefully, if you have problems, um, find one of us. We'll help you do that. Ether pads are really important, okay? So there's a link. Uh, I don't know if I put the, the link is in there, if you can see it. Uh, I will try to, if not, I will write the link up there and paste it. So anyone can help update the ether pad. Right now, the microconferences, uh, we need notes. It's going to be three hours of straight talk. But at the end of the day, we're all going to be exhausted. We won't remember what happened during. The more notes that we have on the ether pad, the better we're going to have information because this is all going to be summarized and posted up on our blogs. Um, my conference leads, we have to write our summaries. And also, there should be two video cameras, right? There's, right, or is this one? Yep, okay, we have two video cameras, one for whoever's talking up here, one for the audience, so our, our conversations are all being recorded. Which brings up, see the Boxes, throwable microphones. Please be careful. This keeps people from being too concentrated on your email and not paying attention to the talks because it, it's always those person that's sitting there like this that gets hit in the head. <laughs> so you gotta pay attention to what's going on in the room. Uh, we also have um, ability to schedule boffs. So if you have something that comes up, you want to discuss something, talk to, go to the registration desk and schedule a room. Hopefully it's first come first serve uh, for doing that. And finally, if you have any questions, look for us with the green lanyards. And let's see, it's six minutes on there, so I'm going to uh, kill that and have you come up. And we'll start, and I'll give you six minutes extra. All right. Is this on? Oh, I have. Yep. I have up. Yes. Okay. Get Great. Two microphones. Uh, all right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Omar Sandoval. I'm a software engineer on the kernel team at Facebook. Uh, I primarily work on ButterFS, but I also do a lot of uh, investigating of bugs that come up in our production kernels. So uh, Dragon is a tool that I built to help with these sorts of investigations. Uh, lately, the kinds of bugs we've been hitting have been really subtle bugs where you have 
different subsystems all with their complicated state all interacting in, in ways and they have to line up just right to get for things to go wrong. Um, and Dragon was built exactly for that sort of thing. Um, so I, I call Dragon a programmable debugger or debugger as a library. Uh, when I say that, I mean uh, as opposed to like your typical debugger workflow, um, Dragon's built around the idea of taking all the kernel variables and types that you get from debug information, is exposing them as, uh, as a magic Python objects that you can then write scripts almost as if you're writing C. Uh, and then you can test your theories, iterate on, on whatever bug you're trying to drill into. So it's easier to demonstrate than it is to explain. So uh, this is just my VM running some kernel version. 5.3, I guess, 5.3 RC8. Yes, absolutely. Is that better, legible? Okay, cool. Um, so I'll just start up Dragon. Uh, it's, by default, it attaches to the running kernel. Uh, it grabs all the debug information from the kernel, imports the, the basic Dragon APIs, and gives you this prog object. So this object is like the, the entryway into all the Dragon functionality, represents the program you're debugging. So you can do stuff like a look up uh, type definitions or look up variables. You can do operations with variables. Um, you can look at structure variables as well. This is a big one, so there's a, a lot there. And it acts just, acts very similar to C. So if you want to look at a structure member, you can just do that, see whatever you need to see. Um, so we can also do more interesting things than, than just poke around at, at uh, individual fields. So for example, a prog, or a, the init task is a task struct for, for the first task that the kernel brings up. It has this, and every task struct has a list of children tasks. Um, so we could look at every task that's a child of this task, if I can remember which order this for each entry takes stuff in. Uh, so uh, list for each entry is, is a helper in Dragon, which is really just Python code written on top of the, the core Dragon functionality. Uh, and, and we can look at all the children of the test struct, or uh, in this case init task, and see that we get the actual init and k thread d. So those are kind of the basic concepts, but uh, rather than just like giving a lecture of, of how Dragon works, I think it's more interesting to look at a actual bug that I, that I investigated using Dragon. Um, I'm going to make the font a little or smaller. I just, I just uh, because I am some stuff I can't really see anywhere. How sure. Do you stuff that's on page number? Oh. Uh-huh. -huh. Okay, <laughs> um, I went into the Dragon CLI, uh, poked around at the at the basic uh, interface. Cool. Okay, we're good. <laughs> All right. So, um, the so the background is I I sent some patches up to the Butterfest mailing list. The maintainer applied them, and uh, he came back to me and said that it caused a deadlock in the next best test. So, um, I managed to reproduce the deadlock. It's been running since last or last night, <laughs> and it's still stuck. So clearly, it's it's stuck, stuck. Uh, so um, the the first thing you usually do when you're going to debug a, a deadlock is look at what tasks are actually stuck. Uh, you can do that. Usually, you do that. Just go look at uh, at uh, var log messages or whatever and see the hung task warnings. But we can do it in in Dragon as well. So might as well do it just to demonstrate. So uh, there's, a, there's another helper for each task that just iterates over every task in, in the kernel. And we can look at just the tasks that are in D state. We can print their PID, command line, and we can even get the stack trace for them. All right, so let's run that.
Hold up. There we go. OK, so we have a, a few tasks. Uh, two of them are, are uh, work queue workers doing some ButterFS work. Uh, then the last one is a user, user space program, which is probably waiting on those workers to finish whatever they're doing. So uh, this one's task, or this one's PID 222. So let's, let's take a closer look at that one. So we can just find it by PID. We have that task. Um, so uh, worker, worker threads have their own state is this legible enough? Okay, cool. So uh, each worker thread has its, it's a struct worker that's associated with it. So to get to it, we need to chase a bunch of pointers since I don't have a helper for it. So we can, we can just basically copy over the C code as Python. So we can see that whoever wrote this abused this set child PID thing to, to shove the K thread into the task struct. So we can we can just grab that out of here. So we have a worker task dot set child PID, and then the worker is the data field of that K thread as a struct worker. So data. Okay, so let's print that out. So this is this is basically just as like if you're writing C and you just didn't have the, the functionality available already. Okay, so this is the struct worker for that K3 we're looking at. Uh, we have some interesting information here. Uh, we have this current work, which is the work struct we're supposed to be working on right now. We have the, the function we're supposed to be executing from the worker right now. And we have this list of, of work that we need to get to soon. So uh, just to, to get an idea of, of what things look like, we can find out how many uh, how many things are scheduled. So we have the worker scheduled list. And hold on, counting parentheses. And let's also look at the the name of the symbol for that current func that we're executing. Yeah, I knew I messed it up. Okay, so we have one thing scheduled and we're executing this ButterFS work helper. So uh, we can go back to the ButterFS code uh, to, to look at what that is because it's not super informative because that's kind of our generic dispatch function in ButterFS that we use for all the async work that we have. But we can see that we have this uh, um, actual work struct that's, that has the ButterFS specific information. So we can, again, kind of copy over the, the definition there. So in this case, the ButterFS work is just a container of the current work in a struct ButterFS work with the name normal work. And that has a function as well. So let, let's look at that. Hopefully it's more informative. Okay, so this is what the ButterFS worker is actually executing, this end work queue function in somewhere in ButterFS. But if you were paying <laughs> close enough attention, we can we can look at the the stack trace that we're looking at just now. So this stack trace says from ButterFS work helper, we're executing this ButterFS end DIO bio, which is not the end work queue function. So that's a little funky. Uh, so Usually when, when there's like a, sorry, do you have a question? Uh, first of all, so this is on a live running kernel, right? Yes. 
so how do you handle the fact that the data structures you're accessing can change underneath your feet? And do you expect them to stay stable? Um, it, each helper kind of handles it ad hoc. Uh, for the most part, I just assume it doesn't change. And if it, do, if it does, like it'll, it'll yeah. crash in Python gracefully, whatever. Okay. Uh, pr presumably, it gets into serious trouble if you try to trace something at Dragonit itself using in order, to pr in order to print the output. Or is it doing all of it? It's all in user space, so you, you're not going to crash the kernel. Yes, but you might deadlock if you're if you're inspecting something that it itself get using to, or, or does it uninstall its own pr own, pr own probe points around? Um, it doesn't probe anything. It's it's entirely in user space, just reading from proc core, which doesn't block ah, or do anything. Right. Yeah. So when it crashes, it will Um. So wait. So all you do is is this just a map like just basically a mapping uh, the memory and. Uh, uh, it reads from proc K core. I would unmap it if it let me. Well, but. that's what I meant. But so, <laughs> uh, so you just basically, it's kind of like I said, it's a debugger that just uh, live running yep. debugger. So if uh, core memory is not available, then this isn't. This is, you only could get this if you have the that memory yeah, available. Yeah, so you need proc K core, you need debugging symbols. Yes, so that's not always on more production systems, though. Mm -hmm. That's usually disabled. Right, there. which is a pain. Uh, at Facebook, we, we have them on. Uh, even our prod kernels leave them in. And that makes life a lot easier for me. Uh, at least distros, you can install the the debug info package, and and it'll find them properly. But yeah, you need them. Cool. All right. Well, um, so to 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 keep it short, uh, the the root cause of the bug is. Uh, so, so we can tell that something's weir weird is going on because we're we think we're executing a diff different function than we actually are, uh, and the reason that happened is because while we were executing our or while the worker thread is still running, we freed the work the work item. The work item was then reallocated as a new work item, and then the work queue code has some mechanism that prevents it from running the same work item twice, and because of the way ButterFS. Uh, uses the same dispatch function for for uh, multiple things. Uh, the work queue code gets tricked into thinking that it's the same work item all over again. It waits for the other one to finish, and if you have a dependency on the one that that is waiting for the other one to finish, you end up with a deadlock. So, fun stuff. I don't know how I would have found it without like having a this introspection. Uh, first, uh, this is okay. This first, just want to say yes. This is uh, this is actually nice to see. It's a uh, cute little trick, but since this is plumbers. Mm -hmm. And we're more talking about, is there, I'm just curious if you're coming up here now, like more of a, instead of just demoing what you've done, um, do you have issues, questions, things yes. you would like to done? Yes. So, because uh -huh. I'm just letting you know that you're more, uh, you're just into the halfway yep. point. Absolutely. Um, okay, so so the, the, the part that I was looking for for feedback or ideas on, uh, the, the big thing that's been gnawing at me is uh, combining this with BPF tracing, because uh, this, this obviously has a lot of overlap in the terms of use cases that you, you'd want to, to use, uh, Dragon has the, the upside that you can run whatever arbitrary looping or, or um, you know, gathering state in whatever Python data structures you want to use. Uh, BPF, you can catch things live, uh, but kind of, it'd be nice to have some way to unify that. Uh, like my crazy idea has been uh, throwing safety out the window and just having a BPF breakpoint. Like you, you insert a BPF program, in certain cases it hits a breakpoint that stops, like, uh, who cares? Uh, then Dragon or w whatever runs and uh, gets, gets like, the, the pointers from BPF that says, here, start doing stuff here. Uh, and then Dragon can go do its thing and then tell the kernel, OK, y you can continue now. Um, but I don't think we have that. I think we'd prevent that from EPP right. happening. Yes. <laughs> That's why it's my, it's my crazy idea for, for how to integrate it. Uh, I talked to Alexei about it. and. Because uh, I think the he he's also been trying to think of ways to to improve debuggability of BPF programs themselves. So there's some overlap there. But um, I mean, if if you're if you're inserting this breakpoint, you're kind of agreeing that like I don't I might deadlock, I might do whatever. It's uh, so probably wouldn't be a prod system thing. But this seems a little similar to like uh, KGDB, right? Anyway. Except KDGB isn't 
the nicest interface. Right. So basically, different. It's a nicer interface for. So if you had something like KGDB. Mm -hmm. Right. KGDB have a Python interface also, or not? Am I misremembering? Uh, I forget how it works. If if you can hook up GDB to KGDB, and GDB does have its Python interface, but uh, it's a little clunkier. One of the issues I see with the breakpoint approach, uh, mm -hmm. if the breakpoint is at the wrong location, just trying to spawn your user space process might actually hit that breakpoint again, right. <laughs> and you're kind of locked on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so moving on from that, another another thing that I've run into is a uh, there's there's a lack of some debugging information in the kernel, particularly macros. Uh, GD or GCC doesn't generate macro debug information by default, uh, so the kernel doesn't. Even when you have like a config debug info equals yes, uh, you don't get macro debug information, and a lot of stuff in the kernel that you really want to know, stuff like a page size or um, uh, like page table layouts, stuff like that, is in debug information or is in the is in macros. So I'm sure that'd be an easy patch, but I'm just curious if anyone else has run into that and, or if they've found different ways to work around it. Uh, has it, anyone that's worked on debugging tools worked around the lack of macros in some way? Okay. Or user it's not ter it's not terribly useful, I know, but um, Dtrace had a mechanism has a mechanism in user space which which is meant to abstract over differences between kernel versions, uh, tr uh, translators which can in effect mimic ma uh, ma uh, macros in C, but you have to rewrite them in the process, which for some of the more horrendous kernel macros is not terribly terribly practical. <laughs> Uh, so, so one thing is the size of the debug info that you need to take mm -hmm. into account. So if you enable this uh, macro information as well, I mean, they're already huge, so right. they're going to be even larger for them. Um, so I'm not sure how the dis distributions will sit with that. I measured it for a large distro kernel, and you've got about nine gig of dwarf debug info, and if you turn on macro, macros, it goes up to about 40. This is <laughs> not terribly practical, and it makes compilation take absolutely forever. <laughs> so um, one thing I've noticed about debug information is that we don't minimize it at all, at least distros don't seem to. Uh, so for example, for the, the BTF, uh, the dwarf to BTF stuff does, does the, all the uh, Andre had his algorithm that, uh, what's the word? Dedupe, there you go. It dedupes everything. Uh, we, it's possible to just do the same thing for dwarf. I think just no one's ever yes, put the effort in to do it. Yes, we have. Oh, you did? It's, and pay, it's painful. It's and actually easy to go, to go from something like, um, uh, there is a reason why most of the dwarf dedup stuff got ripped out of GCC and GCC 8. It kept on crashing and no one could, n no one could fix it. It's much easier to soup up BTF or, as I'm, we're now hoping to, as of this meeting, CTF, so, or, so it can record this sort of thing for you. Of course, ma macros and compactness are not terribly compatible, so it would, might be a, an interesting challenge. <laughs> I'd imagine that it'd be possible to make macro information smaller because the, the header files in the kernel aren't 40 gigs. <laughs> and that's kind of the upper bound on what you need to store, so. Or lower bound, sorry. Right. Okay, it looks like I'm out of time. No, you have two minutes. Oh, okay. I gave you 15 seconds. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so the last thing I, I've, I've run into is uh, VM cores don't include the, uh, VM alloc areas, uh, as well as per CPU areas, other other like specially mapped areas aren't in VM cores. So if you want to read from a VM core, you need to actually walk the page tables, uh, and that's been a pain. So uh, that's another thing I was wondering if anyone has worked around in any other way other than just uh, writing like a, there's this lib, libk dump file that knows how to walk the page tables, but it's because we don't have macro information, it's very kernel version sensitive. Have, have you looked at the, the crash code? Or the, the it, it's the same thing. It walks right. the page tables, yeah. which is a pain. <laughs> yeah, 
it's fragile, so. Now, if we had like a library that maybe the, that somehow, maybe that could help? Yeah, well, the uh, libk dump file is, is that, it knows how to parse kdump file, like a make, fi make dump file format, but it also knows the page tables. But again, like if you don't, if you upgrade kernels without upgrading make dump file, then good luck. <laughs> Well, these are all things that are kind of on my to-do list to, to come up with better ways to do it, but you know, splitting time between this and Butterfest. Cool. All right, thanks. Okay, next up is Masami Hiramazu. There's a kernel debugging tool boff later today. Uh, just so. Do yeah. oh, yeah. um, oh, you want to just plug in yours and yeah. see if it works? Yeah. If there's a problem, then we'll probably plug it right back in yours. Or mine. Right. Well, I can't. Mine's so even fat right now. One more quick update. Um, when you guys do use, uh, we, I love that, that everyone uses these uh, microphone when they talk, that way recording. But uh, could you also stand up because uh, we're trying to get a discussion and people could see who's actually speaking. Uh, right now you're kind of hidden among the crowd. So when you're talking, kind of stand up to talk at least to show who you are. Thank you. If not, I could mind my, well, this isn't working. Uh, where did uh, Omar go? We, we might need a laptop. Oh, okay. oh, there he is. If it's not, if it takes more than two minutes, then we need a. Okay. Uh, it's probably somewhere. Because we only have, I, have two, I, I dedicated two minutes for transfer. <laughs> no, not working. Okay. Um, uh, can I, I have a. Sorry, um, for for later. Uh, so that's our, uh, the, I would like to uh, show our uh, some uh, the recent work for kernel boot time tracing. Um, so we're um, Masami Shiramas, uh working for Linaro and the uh, uh, maintenance of the uh, caper of uh, related things. Um, okay. So uh, what, uh, why we need a kernel boot time tracing? Uh, the kernel boot time tracing is uh, for debugging and uh, analyzing, uh, analyzing that the boot time errors or performance issues. So that uh, we need to uh, measure the performance statistics uh, of the kernel boot or uh, analyze that the kernel drivers issues uh, when a boot uh, or debug the, debug the boot up process or something like that. And actually, uh, we already have uh, some uh, uh, F-trace options for the kernel command line. So uh, yeah, there are some uh, options and uh, you can see that uh, those options under the, the documentation, uh, the kernel parameters. 
Uh, and uh, here is the like uh, example of the kernel command line uh, options for the F trace and tracing. So you can see that the uh, the long uh, kernel command line parameters for the tracing. Yeah, you can do that. But uh, what the issues on the current uh, implementation is a uh, it's a one uh, uh, that there are major two uh, issues. One is the size limitation. Uh, because of the the kernel command line size is very uh, limited under the 256 byte, and uh, half of them are used uh, by the normal command line, so that the, the command line parameter also used for for like a specifying uh, root device or something like that. So that uh, the size is very limited, and the other uh, issue is uh, only part, uh, partial features uh, was it supported. Uh, not uh, full featured, like uh, uh, F-Trace uh, already has uh, two complex features like uh, uh, histograms or something like that, which is uh, not sweet for single uh, single line, <coughs> let's say command line uh, options. Um, so uh, I would like to make it uh, like a park event. Uh, filters and actions, uh, instance making, or histograms. So uh, what the solutions? Uh, one is uh, uh, to use the uh, init lam FS, so, uh, I mean the uh, init uh, process, but uh, it's too late to, uh, to initialize the tracing uh, when after uh, you know, uh, running the init uh, process. Uh, and the uh, uh, second one is uh, maybe uh, expand the kernel command line. But uh, this one is also uh, just make uh, things make uh, more confusing, you know, <laughs> uh, because it's not easy to write down the complex tracing options in, on the uh, boot, uh, bootloader or something like that. And uh, another one is uh, reuse the uh, current, uh, let's say, uh, uh, structured boot uh, time data, like a device tree. Uh, this is actually what uh, I tried uh, at first and the second, uh, let's say, uh, series uh, of the uh, our, uh, my version. So uh, boot time trace uh, V1 uh, version one and the version two is based on uh, actually uh, device three. Uh, device three uh, can uh, uh, is actually um, is very uh, well um, uh, well. Was a destruct, uh, uh, described and uh, structured data, and uh, it's already passed uh, when the kernel is boot. So that are uh, there are many good points, uh, stable and good for the user space tool, good user space tools, and well documented. And most of the bootloader already supported. Yeah, actually, uh, x86 uh, graph uh, doesn't support that. I just ma I need to make a, a patch, but uh, yeah, it's easy. And uh, uh, we uh, talked with uh, some uh, uh, device tree maintainers about this idea, and, but uh, they actually rejected uh, my idea because the, the device tree is uh, standardized and documented as a hardware device, uh, description, uh, not the software configuration or something like that. So that uh, uh, I need to check, uh, find that another way. And uh, uh, V3, I uh, introduced a new uh, supplemental uh, kernel command line. Uh, this is actually, uh, uh, let's say, uh, another device tree, but uh, uh, similar one. And uh, uh, the, so that uh, I introduced a new kernel command line extension. Uh, it is actually uh, a plain ASCII text, so that uh, not the, the binary data, just a plain data, uh, text data, uh, which are uh, written uh, as a tree structured uh, key value uh, list, so that uh, you can uh, write the key value as a keyword equal uh, value, and also you can write down the, uh, the trees. Uh, e those are uh, words. Uh, uh, concatenated with uh, uh, the uh, period. So uh, uh, this uh, is written as a file, a text file, and bootloader 
a kernel uh, load it when uh, uh, kernel boot. And uh, uh, so that the, the, the kernel will pass, uh, pass the, uh, this uh, file at, at the uh, early stage. So I would like to make a demo, but uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, the, uh, with the trouble I cannot do that. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I have a uh, backup slide for what happened. So that's our, uh, so uh, SKC uh, supri uh, supplemental kernel command line based uh, boot time tracing is based on uh, like that. Yeah, you can find, uh, like the, the F trace uh, brace and uh, uh, options. Uh, these options actually uh, we already have uh, on the uh, kernel command line. It's the same uh, mechanism. And also you can uh, expand that the, the, uh, the tree with the events, uh, event and uh, care probes, uh, VFS read or something like that. Uh, yeah, you can uh, write down there, uh, define that the new K probes event with the, uh, yeah, Actually, this one is a very human readable uh, parameters with uh, filters or any, uh, something like that. And also uh, uh, for the um, like a, a synthetic, uh, sorry, uh, histograms, uh, we need to make a, a new uh, synthetic event for uh, consolidating the, the histograms so that uh, uh, this can, uh, you can see that the fres that event and actually it's dot uh, syn synthetic uh, init call latency uh, new event. And uh, with our, uh, these fields and also our actions, you can write the uh, histograms uh, setting on that. And uh, other uh, init call uh, start and finish, you can set that the uh, histogram uh, events, uh, no, uh, histogram actions, trigger actions, which send the, uh, the latency data to uh, this synthetic uh, event. So, uh, oh, like that. And uh, uh, when, uh, how to use that, uh, the, this uh, uh, SKC file? You can write down the file and uh, put the, the, for example, uh, to use that by a grab, uh, you can write down the SKC file and uh, put it under boot and uh, use the SKC command uh, right after the Linux command and put, uh, pass the, uh, the file to SKC on the grab uh, command line. Or uh, you can use that, uh, uh, the SKC on, uh, with QM for testing uh, with the, passing with the uh, SK, uh, hyphen SKC option and uh, uh, like that. So that the, the kernel, setting that the kernel, uh, passing that the kernel with the SKC file. So that the, uh, the QM uh, load, that the QM and the grab load the uh, SKC file on the memory and initialize it uh, to pass the uh, kernel. Not only, yeah, I just implemented that the summer patches for QM and uh, uh, graph for x86, but uh, it's easy to, uh, to uh, uh, support for other architecture. Just load the, the, uh, these files on the memory and pass the, actually it's pass the, the uh, physical address via kernel command line. So that it's very uh, generic. <coughs> So uh, that is the, uh, so uh, the, here is the current status of the, uh, my work. Uh, what's done is uh, uh, make a RFC patch sheets uh, with SKC and uh, also QM and grab uh, implementation uh, made on uh, my uh, repositories. So you can download it and uh, test it. Uh, however, uh, I just get the one, uh, you know, uh, response from the, uh, for this series, so that I, I need uh, your response or replies or any uh, 
comments on that. And uh, uh, I think that uh, we have a, uh, we need to uh, make some more, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, well, well, more things to do. <coughs> uh, one is the actions uh, syntax uh, expansion for the, for the histogram. The, because of the current histogram uh, option is too low and uh, have a different syntax. So that's a, it, uh, not easy to write down. And uh, also uh, the initialize uh, tracing uh, area. That the boot time tracing is currently uh, initialized in a uh, boot, uh, let's say, fs init call. And uh, also we, we need a user space tools for writing that SKC file. Uh, and uh, like uh, uh, evaluating this is light or not. And of course we need uh, to tr uh, discuss with the uh, other uh, person, uh, I'm not sure who is uh, the correct person to talk, but uh, SKC and uh, uh, how we can, uh, uh, you know, good, yeah. I'm curious, have you considered uh, integrating this with the kernel build, so optionally, you could point the, uh, the kernel build to yep. a set of SKC file. They get pulled into the kernel image. And then in, on the command line, you refer to the SKC profiles you want actually loaded for the specific boot. It might uh, easy, uh, make uh, the integration much easier since you just have to integrate within the Linux kernel without having to modify QEMU or GRUB. Yeah, that is uh, another option, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, that is, uh, we, we can, um, yeah. Uh, expand the SKC file, uh, you know, uh, boot, uh, load when boot or load when uh, compile. But yeah. I mean, you could also, yeah, kind of like similar to that, you could also do the uh, kind of like k dump, k exec k dump loads the kernel in there. So you could just say, here's the path so it nodes the boot directory, like where it would load in it RAM disk. You just put in, say, is that basically what you're saying? Just say, hey, here's slash boot slash SKC. Or SKC, maybe you have a kernel command line called SKC equals, and then you put a path name uh, where it will boot up just like it, we could put in a init ram disk or something. And well, not really a net no, ram uh, it's passed by grub. That would need to, uh, you know, uh, put the, the, the file in the uh, init ram fs, and uh, yeah, we, that's we cannot access un unless the, uh, we expand the init ram fs. Yeah, actually, so grub has to actually still load it still yeah. so <laughs> I was thinking about the way, I mean, I'm trying to think about how, like, uh, K dump K exec kind of does an image there. Yeah, but, but the yeah. K, K dump K is also initialized at a later yes. yeah, yeah. stage. So it's so too that, late. Yeah, it's too yeah. late then. That's, that's true. I, so I'm there, sorry, I'm not really familiar with how K exec really yeah. works, but K exec does stuff in user space, right? To, yep. So doesn't K exec have the ability to actually access a file in the running system and incorporate it then into the new boot with K exec? Is that plausible or not? Yeah, I think I hadn't even thought about that before when we were talking. Yeah, it, so. yeah, but uh, in that case, we need to, uh, you know, uh, dual stage boot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, be a two stage boot to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. basically, you're saying like boot up in one kernel, then trigger another, and loads everything for you, then trigger another kernel, and you know where the memory is. Exactly. Like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I don't okay. know if people would want that though. <laughs> Uh, so the, technically, you could you could extend the initial mechanism for that, like just making an initial a two part thing with your SKC like appended yep. to the original, right? Oh, original, oh, sorry, uh, original uh, command line. No, initial or initial fast because this is a f image uh, that you, you load mean, anyway into memory, right? Yeah. So you mean that there are the uh, add the, uh, the file on the, uh, yeah, like a tail of the uh, init ram fs file? Yeah, so append your skc part to the rest of the init ram fs file, and then you have a single image, and then yeah. you uh, you only need an offset into that yeah, to access your skc. It also file. can, uh, yeah, it's possible. Ooh. Yeah, but uh, I think that there, that will, yeah, uh, we need to, uh, I if we can, uh, uh, we would like to change the, uh, the trace command, uh, tracing mm -hmm. uh, script. Uh, we need to prepare that the several different kind of image or uh, NITRAM FS image. That will consume well, the you, too you many. Well, you only need one and then have uh, multiple sections at the end. 
Yeah, uh, like basically you have it and just you concatenate the two. Yeah. And then you I mean actually you can even keep it two separate files, but you just concatenate it to a third file that this is what's going to get loaded into uh yeah. the boot time. Uh, the kernel's build system isn't so good at automatically building those, though. No, um, this wouldn't be a. It would have to be a yeah, user space it, tool. It, it would be desirable anyway, because uh, uh, that way people who who are building your own in, in your so Sorry, yeah. that way people who are building your own in, in your could easily build, um, could easily add early early microcode and that sort of thing, which is also not implemented at the moment, uh, because that uses the same technique of concatenating stuff, I think, onto the front of the in your MFS. So are you suggesting like a generic solution for yeah, this? Yeah, there's already one in the kernel for building in it around is when you compile the kernel. So I, I think I think it just needs enhancement. Um, so it's have it when it's useful. Sorry. Well, I think one of the, yeah. One, one um, real quick one. Hang on. Yeah, we'll go on. Yep. This is boot time tracing. Yep. So you said in it around MFS, it's already too late. Yeah, too late. Like we've already booted. Yeah. No, no, but the in it around MFS is, is loaded into memory. No, that's that's late. Was it? That's still too late where it's that's in way too late. I th well, wait. No, that's yeah, the no, uh, boot run actually load, like, but uh, we need to uh, have our summer uh, hit that. Uh, what's it? Um, oh, knowing where it is. Yeah, no, uh, we need what? to um, have our parser to parse the, the, the images. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just saying. No, it's see, loaded during boot, but it's late in boot. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, no, the, no, no, no. Uh, the grub loads in it, like when you, on x86. No, no, no. Yeah. The kernel doesn't unpack the init RAMFS until later. Yes, but we only have to know where the we, we only have to know where it is. I mean, say if it's concatenated. So we're not un we're not we're not putting it into the init RAM. We're not unexpanding. We're just saying here's a blob of memory on the end, yeah. and on yeah, the end we put the SKC file, so we know where the init RAM disk is. That's not just a terrible. Okay, maybe that could work. And read that. So my the other option is the device tree maintainers are wrong. Because the device tree does already have a configuration in it. It has the kernel command line in it, okay. right? Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think wait, here, throw the mic back. Do you want me to throw this it's, mic? It's mostly about Heads hardware, up. but not all of it. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, one of the big problems with putting um, extra configuration stuff into the DT is stuff like kexec, especially with kexec followed, we have to go and sanitize the chosen node. And we really want to keep most of that idempotent, other than the command line, which, uh, which is called bootargs, that we change all the time. We want to keep some other stuff, like uh, the uh, stood out path, but we don't want to mess around. With, and we want to clean. We have to clean some other things, like the initrd properties. Uh, we've got this mismatch of things that we've got to keep and things that we've got to remove. And I really don't want to have to change that code in the kexec file load path every kernel release when we add a new thing that we might want to keep or we might want to remove. So having this in the command line is nice because that's something that is transient from boot to boot already. Yeah, so that that is a really nice feature of except kexec already copies it or you know kexec file load does not copy the command line. It uses the command line as it's handed from user space. Kexec in user space also so, yeah. can use whatever it's handed or it can copy the existing thing. But when you're using kexec from user space without kexec file load, it's you can do absolutely anything. So who cares? Yeah, but uh, yeah. Uh, please consider that uh, if we cannot uh, use the uh, kexec like a uh, new architecture or something like that. But the uh, tracing can do that. Yeah. Okay, uh, this time is up. Oh, so okay. <laughs> so actually, yeah, if you want to have a wrap up real quick, or yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I just sir uh, uh, had it. No, no, I just uh, have this one is the last story. Uh, another one is uh, just uh, explain explain what happened. Yeah, uh, like that. Okay. okay so um, we, this we want. Should we take a boss later on to discuss it further? Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah no. Uh, Yep. Continue the, let's continue the conversation. Uh, we kind of have an idea, so let's call it. We'll set up the rest of the example. So next, we gotta go to the next okay. person. Uh, Peter, yep. I think you're reasonable now. <laughs> Thank you. Frank is there on Oh, I thought you were at the center of the passing universe. I really don't want to get in the habit. I think the core has got to, the center of gravity has got to be somewhere right here between us. Also, I know that X86 
say six, it doesn't do anything we don't know. If it's added DT and AC5, it will use both simultaneously, which is insane. Because <laughs> <laughs> no one has thought about it this one. Yeah. 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 So, uh, good morning, everyone. Great, this works. So, my name is Song Liu, and I'm David Carrillo. So today, we, so today we want to talk about uh, share PMU counters across the compatible perf event. So basically, the problem we're looking at is like uh, we have more perf event than the PMU counter provided by the, the hardware. So basically. In some environment, uh, like uh, our company Facebook, we have different tools. They all counting the same thing, like cycles, instructions, but they have different scope or sometimes different tools counting at the same scope. We, we, we cannot uh, like really limit them. And they do per CPU events, there will be per task event, and it could be C group per C group events. And sometimes you have nested C group, you count every, diff, diff, every layer, you have different counters. So they all count the same thing, but they are separate perf event. So when we have like a more perf event, then we have the counters, we are gonna do the time multiplex thing, which is through this perf rotate context function. So here's a very like easy example. I, I always play with, we use the, it's x86, we use the ref cycles uh, event, which we, there's only one counter can serve it. So if you do that twice, Easily you get uh, like a uh, multiplexing. So one event gets uh, scheduled three thirds of, uh, three fourths of the time, the other get one fourth of the time. That's a not bug, it's by design, there's no guarantee you get an equal amount of time. But you basically the rotation makes sure you get uh, some time to run. This is a problem like first, like uh, the time multiplexing is very expensive. It's kind of false, like a reschedule of your perf event every millisecond by, define, uh, by default. And also like it's not uh, accurate when you do this multiplexing and when you do like a context switch, if that happens too much, you probably didn't get much time to run. You do the, con uh, you're already off the CPU. Is that thing on? Yeah. So. So the unfairness there, that is something I do want to fix. Scary little <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> it's just that it's a lot of work. We need to rewrite most of how all that core scheduling works. Um, a year or two ago, I posted, oh, what was it? A year and a half, I don't know. I re posted some yeah. start of that rewrite. I just haven't had time afterwards to look at it ever again. Um, but it's it's doable, uh, fixing that fairness. But in this case, we reduce the need to reduce the unfairness. No, I mean... It's like different problems, I think. Yeah, but you, you brought up. So um, I'm saying this is fixable. Mm -hmm. Yep. So let's see. So what do we do we with the share uh, PMU? So if we think multiple 
proof events that are compatible. So technically, they can share one hardware counter. And for here, I have a very conservative definition of compatible. I mean, they count exactly the same thing. And I think in the future, we can extend that uh, to have a sample count, uh, event and a counting event share the, uh, the hardware counter is totally possible. But for, for now, I think uh, just the share for only the counting ones will be a big win already. So what's the benefit? The first is gonna be like uh, we're gonna avoid or at least reduce the time multiplexing. thing. So instead, so if we go back to this example, this two gonna share the same counter, there won't be any time, like uh, time multiplexing at all. And, and again, like, uh, if we, we share them and say we have two cycles, they, we only do like a time multiplexing, but we need to program the hardware counter twice. That also spends time. In this case, if we have the sharing, they're gonna share the same counter. We leave the other counter idle. This also save us cycles in like programming the PMUs. Samples of these. Okay. Could you please give us some examples of compatible perf counters? I mean, you can have like cash misses, cash uh, coherency, whatever, whatever. So it helps if you give a little more context here. Uh, so it's pretty much compatible right now. I have it mean identical you're counting exactly the same thing. The two perf events say, if you have one per CPU uh, event and one for you attached to your per task event, and this, oh, this might not be a good example, but like they're all counting the same, exactly the same thing. They're gonna share the same counter. So the, uh, it's compatible, meaning like uh, they're counting the same metric from hardware point of view, that's identical. So what is different in the two events then? Is it the process or it's something? It's the scope. So in this example, if you open one per CPU, one per task, and one per C group, okay, you okay. will use three different counters in the hardware. Okay. One for each one of these scopes. Okay, got it. And also sometimes if you have multiple application trying to like monitor the same thing, you could have two per CPU events doing exactly the same thing and the perf code will treat it as a totally separate uh, uh, perf event. Okay, hold the mic for the back of the room. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, we'll shoot. so we have two proposals uh, here. One is we implement in the perf call code. So basically, I think we should show this one first. So basically, we have this concept of uh, uh, perf event contact, which we hold a bunch of like uh, a bunch of uh, perf events, and basically each CPU have two contacts uh, at any time. It's uh, your CPU contact and uh, the one comes with your task. It's the task contact. So we want to introduce this thing is the perf event uh, deduplicate, and which you have different multiple perf event pointing to the, this uh, deduplicate. And this one goes to a master event, which one, which has is the real event we're gonna schedule. So if you want to enable both of them, it's actually enable that master event, and you just uh, counting into both events at the same time. So what's the benefit? Is like uh, if it's in the core code, so we pretty much do do it once, and all the perf events get the same benefit, and we also. Uh, optimize this thing to we only, we, we will be able to detect the perf event when you open or close this. Uh, uh, we only detect the compatible events when we open the new event. So we are not uh, doing any comparison of different events at uh, contact switch or the rotation, which means we, we try to only put the overhead in the non-critical path. The critical path is uh, equally expensive or cheaper if we consider the benefit of programming less and less rotations. And right now there's a problem with it. It's like uh, 
because we need this uh, context, uh, uh, we, we only do the sharing within this context. So if you are perf event in your CPU context and your task context, will not be able to share the performance context, which is, a, which may or may not be a problem depends on the use case. So that's the, the problem. Oh, sorry. So that's the, the one of the problem. The second problem is we have this new, like a data structure is a little bit more complex, but I, I feel that I, I have fixed all the bug. I think this works great in my test. So hopefully it's not a problem in implementation, but they are gonna be a problem. The complexity is gonna be a problem for like a future maintenance, which means Peter's problem, not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the other proposal is uh, like a while back, a GV author proposed and also David uh, echoes that uh, uh, proposal. It's like, we just do that in the, for each architecture or for each PMU in that code. And we have this, uh, this the benefit and uh, the pros and cons just reverse. In this case, because there's no context uh, uh, concept, so we can share a, a CPU event and a task event. And of course the problem we will, because there's no context uh, concept, so we, when you do the, after the context switch, you have to compile again, which means you pretty much, whenever you program your, your, uh, your hardware counters, you will need to look at the, whether these two events are compatible. So it looks like something when you do the PMU add, you try, oh, I have this event, and whether it's compatible, is it compatible, we set up the compatible events, otherwise we do the, we do the existing code to find a new hardware counter for it. So, um, so if, if you're gonna, yeah. Um, so if you're gonna do it at PMU add, um, which is at the boundary of the, the interface, you might as well then pull it into the core code. And, and I mean, if you're gonna change all the PMU adds to do the same thing, you might as well just pull it across the layer again. And I think you've proposed doing something else uh, like that as well at some point, I forgot. Um, so instead of doing it inside the ad call, do it outside in the core code. Um, the tricky bit is of course to find compatible events. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Um, especially if you do a, a um, schedule of a counter group, um, you will not actually do the scheduling until the last event when the transaction closes. That's when you do schedulability analysis uh, and, and then try and assign all these things. Um, Yeah, I don't know, I'd, I'd have to think about it, but if you do it in PMU add, you might as well just do it one layer above uh, in, in the core code. I think. Yeah, I think that uh, that uh, that also works. It just, oh, oh in actually the difference is whether we have this uh, context, we, we take the context some concept inside. So basically, if I look at this pros and cons for the two proposals, they just reverse, it's like, if you want to detect the compatible events, uh, if we, we want, we do not want to do this at context switch and rotation, we will limit it to the like uh, within CPU context or the, the task uh, context. Otherwise, like uh, if we, we want to do the, you know, yeah. pretty much we cannot get the both. But the devil is in the details that, that find compatible event function, that one's gonna be tricky. Um. Uh, right. Cannot be just identical uh, configurations. Well, sure, but um, you still have to find it, and preferably quickly. Um, if you can just do a linear search, and that might work. Yeah, the other. <laughs> no, it's it's just a, a performance thing mostly. Um, 
Well, how how to not spend too much time on, on trying to figure out who shares what. A and that's why song proposal number one isn't at context switch time, it's at load event time. Correct. Yeah. Or event so that's time. But yeah, then the, the downside is you do not share between um, CPU counters and task counters. So there was another proposal a few weeks ago, maybe, that tagged all events with a C group ID. Uh, because a few slides back you had um, here within different nested C groups, that one would go away. You just have the one per CPU counter. But then each event would have a C group ID. Uh, so you could. Okay, yeah, I think that that's gonna work. Uh, that's gonna work and so you have a C group. Oh, uh, well, that's still the same problem, right? If you have a, like a parent C group and a children C group, you're gonna schedule both at the same, you're gonna enable both at so the same so time. So the samples would have the most specific C group in them, I think, and then the software, once you read them, you can then propagate up the hierarchy. Oh, that's that's nice, I didn't know that. So you're gonna, the C group code is gonna aggregate the values, that's. Well, user space will have to do that, but. Um, oh. we, we've had performance problems propagating up the hierarchy. I, I am aware, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yay for secret. <laughs> it's a feature. So in that proposal, it would be one event for CPU, one for C group, and one for task. Um, so so it, it would maybe help with the, with the per nested C group issue. Um, so then the, the per CPU samples can be tagged with a C group ID. So you know what C group originated the sample, and then you can reconstruct everything in post. Sort of, kind of maybe. So, but uh, what happens if some C groups are not uh, don't have events? Then they will not. Okay. But then the CPU event uh, must be measured independently, right? Um, what? Because if you have, if you don't have an event for all the C groups that are running. Uh, oh no no so so you it it's just. The regular CPU wide event it will count everything. Okay. It's just that the samples it generates. It's, this is so. This is a sampling event. Every sample will have a C group tag on. Okay. What most specific C group do I does this process run in? Mm -hmm. And then Post can reconstruct the hierarchy, the C group hierarchy, if it wants to. Okay, but then you have to pay the context switch cost, even if you don't want to monitor a C group. No, no, th there is no context switch cost. It is just a regular per CPU event. It doesn't get scheduled when C groups change. Mm -hmm. It's just that every time it generates a sample, it also outputs the um, C group ID of the current task. Okay. Does it have to read the counter? Well, yes, it will have to read the counter, but. Um, I mean, it does everything that the normal sample already does. All it does is add the ability to output the C group ID. Yeah. Um, so then at post time, you can reconstruct um, the C group data. I just wondered if there's some deployments where the, the user don't want to have all the C groups being monitored to reduce the context switch uh, overhead. In that case, you will pay, like, even if you only have some of the C groups with events. So, so there is also patches that um, make scheduling many of the C group counters cheaper, mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's a, a different thing. Got one more minute, so it's up to you if you want to give it up or. Yeah, I think that's a uh, very good uh, suggestion, so I think we can continue yeah. the discussion. Peter, I'm gonna try to pick your brain later. I'll do the ad board notes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Hello. Hello, my name is Svetmir Spianov, and uh, I'm part of uh, the Open Source Technology Center at uh, BOR. Today I would like to discuss with you the X-ray histograms and uh, in particular the, the way they are configured and to, to think about uh, a solution to somehow to, to simplify this uh, configuration and to make it more, uh, more useful. I guess that uh, most of you are familiar with the X-ray histograms, that's why I'm not going to focus on the histograms uh, itself but only in their configuration. Actually, can I go real quick? How many people here uh, are familiar that of the Linux histogram code that's inside? How many people are not familiar with the Linux histogram code within? So there's a lot of people that are not familiar <laughs> okay. with the Linux histogram okay. code. I've not read the actual code. Is it just <laughs> no, no, I mean, not I'm just have, knowing that it at least exists. So, so uh, I'm going to, to, this, to describe uh, shortly the uh, histogram idea. The histograms were implemented by Tom Zanussian, first introducing the Linux kernel 4.7 a few years ago. It's a very powerful feature, but uh, the main drawback is that it is configured, it's uh, very, very hard, uh, it uh, has very focused configuration, uh, especially in the case when uh, you want to do something more, more interesting. I'm going to show you a few examples of uh, configuration of histograms. This is the, the, the very basic histogram configuration. You had to write this magic string into the clear configuration file of the F3, so desired F3 uh, event. Here in this example, we are interested in the applications, uh, page hold per application. That's why the key in our histogram is the application uh, name and the values that are accumulated and page hold hits per application. Uh, this is how our histogram looks like. In the, the left side uh, are the names of the applications. On the right side are the accumulated page hold hits. Uh, since I just want to real quick, uh, just to let you know, if in that very first line there, it's assumed that you're already in the in the tracefs directory, so slash sys slash kernel slash tracing or debug slash uh, yeah, I, I guess it yeah. because the, the command line is uh, too big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a basic example. Uh, the, the more interesting thing is uh, when you want to to measure the latency between two uh, two F trace events. In this example, the first event is uh, sysenter send message and the, the second one is sysexit uh, send message. And in order to do that, uh, we need to configure uh, the so-called synthetic event, which is called uh, send latency here, and to accumulate the histogram in the context of this synthetic event. How this uh, configuration looks like, it's uh, complex. First, we need to define the synthetic event by uh, defining its name send latency and its uh, parameters uh, lat and uh, pid. Then we have to, to define a trigger in the, the first event, this ent enter send message. And in that uh, trigger, we, are, uh, we have to save the timestamp time of this event in the, into the var variable ts0. Then the third one is the most interested one. We have to define the the histogram into the, uh, into the trigger file of the sys exit send message, the second event. And on this, uh, on this histogram, we are interested on match between both events, sys enter send uh, message and sys exit send message. Uh, the match means that uh, uh, the keys of the both histograms must be equal. So the common PID of the first event uh, should be equal to the common PID of the second event. And uh, in this case, we have a match. In case of a match, we trigger the sent latency uh, synthetic event with the desired parameters, a late and common PID. Um, here, the, the late variable is calculated uh, by subtracting the both timestamps of the both events. And the last one is uh, the configuration of the histogram itself that we are interested in. It is in the context of the sent latency synthetic event, previously defined synthetic event. And this is how our histogram, histogram looks like in this case. The output is like in the first one. The, the third example is uh, even more complex. Uh, not that uh, we are not limited to, to measure latency between only two events. We can measure latency between multiple events. The, uh, the only limitation is that uh, we have to 
the, the both events that uh, we are matching uh, must have some common fields that uh, that are matchable. Um, but uh, in example, if there is uh, no common field between uh, two events, but uh, we uh, still want to, to measure the latency between them, we can do it using this artificial synthetic events. In this example, we're going to, to measure the latency between H of time at start event and uh, the switch event. There is no com common fields between them mm, that uh, we can use for matching. That's why we, we have to define the IQ, IQ latency synthetic event uh, to, to accumulate uh, the histogram in that uh, event uh, between H of time and start and get waiting. And the second latency, and the, the second synthetic event wake up let, uh, that will match the RQ let uh, synthetic uh, event with the desired get switch. How this con config looks like? Much more complex. But uh, the, the, the idea is the same as uh, with the previous one, but the, 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 the configuration is bigger. We have to define the both synthetic events at your late and wake up, wake late with their parameters, uh, let and uh, PID. And after that, we we'll define the histograms in the HR timer, set, get wake, waking, calculate and see the all, all events that are interested. We can chain here as much events as we wish. There is no limitation. The histogram that we are configured uh, was accumulated in the wake clad synthetic events, and it looks like that. So, what is the the goal of this uh, discussion? Uh, some, somehow to to define some simple simple interface to to describe in more user friendly way this uh, this histogram configuration and the idea is to use the trace in the application to to config the actual uh, required synthetic events histograms in the events and to fit uh, the trace in deal with uh, some simple simple string that describes that in the best case uh, this uh, syntax should uh, cover all histogram operations or at least the most common common use cases it should be as simple as possible. We discussed this issue on the real-time tracing summit uh, this year with uh, Steve Rosette, Tom Zanussi, and uh, Lucas, Lucas Bovan, I think. And uh, the Lucas came up with the solution to use uh, SQL-like syntax interface to describe uh, the relations between those events. We can think of events uh, as SQL tables and events fields as SQL columns and to, to use this uh, uh, SQL-like uh, syntax to describe our histogram. The idea is for to first to, to, dis to, uh, to, <coughs> to define the, the histogram name with uh, its parameters. These are the values and the keys of the histogram. Then to, to define like uh, SQL joins the, the event that we are interested in. Start event, join, end event, and we can chain here as much events as uh, we, we want. And then to, to define what are the matching fields between this event in order to, to have a match between them. Start event field must be equal to the end event field. And optionally, uh, we can define any conditions if there are such conditions. So, uh, how this uh, syntax maps to the examples uh, before uh, above. Here is the, the, the latency between the two events. Um, we define the, with this select SQL syntax, the sent latency uh, synthetic event with uh, uh, two, two parameters, latent PID. Here we define how this latency is uh, let the uh, variable is uh, calculated by subtracting the both timestamps of the uh, both interested events. And the PID is uh, just equal to the common PID of the second event. Then we define with this uh, from join SQL statement the uh, both uh, syscalls, uh, sysenter sent message and sysexit sent message. And we, we define the, the matching criteria. 
that, yes, it's, yeah, I was about to say, uh, okay, you got a question. I was going to stop you here because I think this is a very important slide okay. that we want, to, we want to talk about, but yes. Uh, hello. Yeah, so I was wondering, I just played around with um, BPF trace for a day, enough to go through some, some of the examples, and I was struck by the uh, fairly simple syntax of the language that it has in there, which reduces this problem down to some yeah. very clear code. I hope that the but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not clear, and I bet a bunch of other people aren't completely clear on what's common between BPF trace and this problem, and, and for example, why wouldn't I just run a little BPF trace program to solve this? Uh, very good question. Um, one thing is, yes, BPF trace is awesome if it's available. A lot of cases it's not. Uh, this is very, very simple. One thing that F-Trace has always been doing, the only tool you really need is, well, because you could do everything here and also you could get the syntax out of it if you want. The er, only tool you need to run F-Trace is BusyBox. I mean, you just have it uh, on embedded devices, whatnot, you might want to be doing this in lots of situations. BPF is great, yes. I, I, people always say, BPF could do everything F-Trace can do, basically. Why do you have F-Trace? I said, okay, why do we have Bash, since C could do everything that Bash can do. Um, so Bash scripts. I always, my analogy is BPF is C, uh, F trace is Bash. So when you want to do something that's very simple, very common, that it's quick, um, if you don't have BPF available, it's right here, it's available. That's the reason why we, we have this here. Make sense? Okay. Um, but I, well, I go back just to say, one reason why that a lot of people haven't used the latency code, it was actually something that's really been pushed by the real time, um, is because of the complexity of the format. and. Yeah, down you could almost say, well, maybe it's not that, or maybe the bottom is still complex, but we're trying to make it into something that's a little bit more human readable, even though SQL is not always the best thing, but that's something a lot of people know, even though, like, reluctantly know. Uh, I know SQL because I, ha I maintain my own database server for my mail server and stuff like that, so I had to learn SQL. When Lucas mentioned it, that he said, okay, why don't you just, this is like tables in data. But, well, you're right, you have a couple tables, if you could kind of use SQL format, we try to keep as close to possible that things that will work by any SQL book, we could kind of implement it this way. So the only little trick is here, um, down below, like we have a dash dash select, kind of like the select command. The only thing different is the very first send latency uh, right there, that colon, that creates a synthetic event for you. So after you do this command on trace command, that actually will be a synthetic event that then you can actually enable tracing on. So you actually, it's more than just SQL. So it does do, we're trying to do everything that you could do in F trace. So yes, um, we're just trying to say, okay, say, send latency lat, and then here you'll notice it was the, the two timestamps here, and we could even probably make that into something easier to write, but we're just saying this minus this. I want the latency to be this minus this, where up above you had to do this on match thing, and then you know pass create a variable to pass between the two, and the second one removes the access of, you, we, don't, we don't show the variables, so you don't have to worry about variables to, uh, the variable up on top, you'll see the TSO zero up on top equals common timestamp. So when the uh, send the send message triggers, uh, that every time every instance will be the t the timestamp will be recorded in that TSO uh, variable. When we do the on match in the second event, which is this exit send message, then we have that it'll, when it has a match, it has that variable var available for that guy. And then you can do the subtraction of it. That's kind of hard to remember, hard to write up and knowing the command sequence. We're just trying to say, okay, I want send latency, um, send message minus uh, from the, uh, what's it called, send message um, from the exit to the enter. Oh yeah, the exit timestamp minus the enter timestamp will equal my latency. That, and that's pretty easy. I mean, yeah, the, it's long variables, but it's really just, okay, when it ended, subtract it from when it started, there's my latency. So we're just simplifying it. So it, trace command will do all the, have you, and, it, uh, and it will give an option to say, here's the command you use so you cut and paste and put it on your busy box uh, line if you want to use it there. Does that make sense? Is anyone objectionable about using like this type of syntax or? Oh yeah, or. So, so kind of going back to what was said earlier, why not a syntax? Uh, you said BPF trace isn't everywhere, but what about a syntax that is like BPF trace so that you have a common type of scripting language? Yes, I'd second that, but I'd also say I have run into use cases, for example, OS query, where people think in an SQL-like syntax. 
and they would actually like to take BPF trace and turn it into SQL, which I find going the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I, I can imagine this, the primary uses of this may be turning this into a OS query module because they want to use OS, it. OS query? I'm not so far. OS query, it's, it's very popular, it's a monitoring agent, SQL-like syntax, who uses OS query? Well, I, I, oh, I hear okay. it's OS popular. Query. I hear it's popular. <laughs> it may not so be whatever, popular in this room. Write down OS query on the because uh, I want to look at more into that. Yes, um, if, you, if you want that. The reason why, also, like I said, BPF. I've looked at what we discussed. This actually was one of our first discussions at the real time summit. Is saying using the BPF syntax for this, and BPF is much more complex. And then we're like, okay, we have to really rip it down to limiting it. And we're like, okay. And then the more we talked about it, we kept coming up with a lot of issues. Like, well that people are going to expect it to do more than it can do, and uh, yes, it could do everything, and then we were trying to figure out, and then we couldn't come up with a good BPF limited like, subset, and that's when someone said, you know, it sounds like this is just a bunch of tables you're manipulating, why not just use SQL? And Because it really is, it's just tables. That's where we're manipulating, we're not doing logic. I mean, we have, we're not doing the trigger and stuff like that, that's something else, but this is just saying, we just want latencies, or we want ways, we're doing histograms between events. This is all, and right now you could put multiple events Follow the latency because that's a very very common thing that people ask for, right? But okay. but I, th I think there are two different audiences. Some will be happy with this, and then there is a different audience who want to take the BPF trace syntax and have it compiled to synthetic events. So I, I think even within BPF, and Brendan knows this much better than I do, there it, it's not one thing, right? There's BPF trace, and then there's BPF utils, and you know there are a lot of different ways to do the same thing with BPF, and I think. This is another way to do something similar. And so my bigger question is, um, like inside the kernel, can we be doing some of the same things to set up this generic idea of, you know, managing latency between events or, you know, it, so I care more about like the kernel side consistency instead of like, you know, a handful of utilities that end up triggering the same. Actually, this proposal is only in the user space. Uh, it uses uh, the, the, existing, uh, the existing histogram configuration interface. It's only a wrapper. So uh, I have a, yeah, I think this, uh, this one is a very good uh, syntax and uh, a bit, but a bit, uh, you know, uh, the, the information is, uh, what's the, it's a bit long. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, we, we, we try to, to make it as short as possible, but uh, we have somehow to describe uh, all yeah, these relations. Uh, we can see that the many sys exit se uh, send message uh, yeah, are, yeah, many, uh, you know, you want one of them may duplicate information. You mean? Yeah. Here, I need a mic on. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean that's actually why we we haven't implemented this yet. This is uh, one of those things. Like you said, this is we're just working on a syntax. We haven't even started the work on actually implementing this. We're just trying to see. We're tr we're basically just mapping things right now. If you have ways, ideas, that's why we're presenting this at Plumbers because we don't know where we're going yet. Yes, we could change it to BPF. We haven't done anything. This is just the planning stages right now. So yes, we need help. Uh, I can make a boff. Would it be people interested in coming to a boff that would discuss this maybe? Or we could discuss it later? Okay, so we'll set up yeah. a boff, but we will. So Steve? Uh, will we make, uh, make our boff about the third tracing? If there's a rule available. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, if yeah, there's room available, I'll continue with a boff, yeah. I just want to suggest that w this might not be the right answer to help you define with it, because people who are familiar with SQL are often admins and pe dealing with tables all the time anyway. I am not such a person. I, when I, I go look at Brendan Gregg's pages when I need to do first stuff, right, yeah. and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't memorize all those things, and I don't memorize SQL syntax, and I don't have a preference for it particularly. I will use whatever works. And I think the admins who do regular SQL work will probably love this, right? It'll be okay. much easier for them to use and figure out what's going on in the system. Well, and the things that work, the things that work have really good examples, well documented on the web. I'm, I'm looking at Brendan here because he's really good at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, we will definitely have. That's it. why it it works so well. We just have a directory distributed on every machine, well, with all of the examples, and that's what people build on top of when they're debugging problems. Yeah, Etherpad person, whoever, could you just add add examples? Yeah, I I uh, sorry, I, I wanted to add one thing to that, which is that I I'm coming in as as a like a BPF trace somewhat newbie, so I spent you know half a day learning it. I was struck by uh, what the learning curve felt like. So it was a comfortable learning curve, 
but there is one. You know, I had to I had to burn that half a day to learn it, and taking the time to learn a new anything is you know something. So where you want to go is you want to look at the source of all the stuff. So you end up looking at the kernel trace events, both in the kernel tree and under uh, sys, you know, um, whatever debug. Um, if you if you go off into SQL, you do lose a little bit of that, um, both in terms of uh, you know the subtraction and all that is a little bit on SQL awesome. and and you can find the events in the kernel and those line up really well with the BPF trace. So my takeaway from the whole thing was that learning BPF trace was not hard because I, the kernel source and the mounted sys and and, uh, and proc were there to help me, mm -hmm. and I could find out what the events were and I could match them all up. But if you go to SQL, you'll lose a little bit of that. Yeah. I, I do understand. I, there is a thing. Believe me, I hate SQL, but I picked it because it was kind of like. It, I mean, if you think of it that way, it was actually it made the syntax actually easier than a lot of the things I came up with. Uh, real quick, you want to switch to the next couple slides? I think the one you had. I think the the, the one. Wait, you had the, uh, the the more complex version. Yeah, this is the more. This was the the example that does that one complex, real complex one. This is actually you'd be two select statements. This would be all in one line, obviously. So I was just giving you an idea of this. Well, uh, basically, we have to go to the break now. So. Um, we end this, so I wanted to basically let's have a discussion with this and we'll come up with my board. Like I said, this is more of a design stage. We could get it if it works. If we could find a better way, we're all we're right now very open minded. So uh, thank you very much. Well, I'll hopefully we'll post it and it's break time. Okay, uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, hopefully, some more people. The only problem with breaks is it gives people an excuse not to come back. <laughs> Especially when it's like you're exhausted. But um, anyway, we're going to continue off. Uh, Jeremy is the, the yep. way you pronounce it? Okay, yeah. so I, and uh, um, how do you pronounce your last name? Galarno. Galarno? Yeah. Okay, so Jeremy Galarno will be now talking about unifying tracing processing ecosystems with Babel Trace or something like that. <laughs> but I'll be going to work with them afterwards, so. Okay, so uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, actually, Stephen and I are going to speak about the same thing, which is uh, <laughs> unifying trace processing ecosystems. Uh, you may notice that I'm not wearing any body armor, uh, so I'm not trying to unify tracers. Okay, don't want to get into that. No ring buffers. No, no, no unify. No, no discussion of uh, unification of uh, ring buffers is going to happen, uh, at least while I'm in front. <laughs> so. Um, Basically, the, the, what we're trying to achieve is, uh, is that there's a situation right now where there are a lot of tools that are uh, trace processing tools that are targeted for um, uh, specific tracers, and there's no reason for that. I mean, typically, it's only because they all output their own output formats, and I mean, all tracers have their own uh, use cases, but at the end of the day, they all extract pretty much the same information. So there's no technical reason uh, for, uh, for tools not to reuse the same a trace reading code, trace uh, processing code, if you want to filter, all that, all that stuff can be reused. Uh, and this is what Babel Trace tries to achieve. Uh, Babel Trace already exists. What I'm going to present is basically what we're introducing in Babel Trace 2, uh, just to give a bit of context before we go into the open discussion. So, Babel Trace, the goal is to consume, manipulate, and convert traces of various formats. So, it's tracer agnostic for all intents and purposes. The goal um, when I say trace manipulation, it's basically filtering, uh, removing fields, changing field values, adding debug information, those kind of things in traces. Um, and we want to basically aggregate and correlate kernel traces, user space traces, logs, uh, could be PCAP traces, hardware traces. Um, it's already used in the kernel tree uh, for the perf to CTF converter. Uh, so that's already out there. Um, and Babel Trace is cross-platform. So it, it works on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Uh, so the big idea before the discussion is uh, if you've ever uh, toyed with GStreamer, FFmpeg, DirectShow, a number of those uh, video frameworks, uh, basically you recognize this. Uh, you have sources, filters, and sinks. To give you an idea, when you assemble a graph in Babel Trace, you have sources, so those really handle the, the ingest of events. So reading a CTF trace, reading a perf trace, uh, a D message output could be anything. Then you insert a, a number of filters. The one that is there is a moxer, so basically it does the correlation between all traces to present them as a single time ordered stream of events. So any viewer could use that um, to, to, 
to do any number of things. And then you have sinks. So basically sinks can be analysis. In that, in that case, that's a pretty printer and that's the typical use when you use the actual Babel trace binary. Um, uh, for Babel trace too, I mean, uh, all uh, the APIs are stable right now and we're just working on the documentation. So it's gonna be released uh, within a few weeks. At least the release candidate one is gonna be released uh, within a few weeks. So the discussion points, and this is where we have a lot of overlap, uh, Stephen and I. Um, the first point I wanna bring up is trace format stability and interface. Um, I work on LTTNG, so LTTNG uses a CTF, which is an external spec that is not, oh, am I good? Okay. <laughs> um, it's an external uh, spec, so it's not like the, the format of LTTNG, so it doesn't change. Uh, it's self-described and LTTNG just produces that format and there are a number of tracers that use that. Um, but there are tracers that will have a very um, flexible trace format that may change with every release. Uh, I don't know if that's the case of uh, perf and F trace. I don't know if there's an intent to keep con binary compatibility in terms of trace format. Uh, okay, the trace, uh, just trace command trace.dat file actually works uh, trace, uh, trace command 1.0 can read the 3.0 trace data files. It may not have, a, if there's a new features, it uses options to extend the file, but whatever it can read, it can read. So we try to keep forward and backward compatibility okay. in the trace.dat file. Okay. So did I answer your question on that one? Yeah, that's, that's my question. And I, and I mean, this is where um, a big problem that we have uh, with Babel Trace, we have Basically, all the components that you saw could be in the bubble trace tree or out of tree. We have a plugin system. And for a lot of hardware traces and things like that, it makes sense to carry that out of tree because the formats may change, they may not be documented, and they may not be um, open sourceable, if, that, if that's a, a word. <laughs> and um, so basically, we want to accommodate that. And my question to, uh, to you, uh, which you answered, is basically should we use libtrace event? to consume uh, F-trace uh, traces, or is there like a viewer, that, uh, um, a library that we can already use and sort of write a wrapper around it? Or? Uh, actually, yeah, we're, we're still, okay, the code is there, it's just not a library yet um, for traces. We're trying to pull out all the writing and reading of the trace.dat file into its own library, or we'll probably even call it lib, lib F trace since it's specifically focused for F-trace. Um, that will allow you to, it's also, it's not like, um, there's what we wanted to be able to do is not just read, write the file, but also be enable and disable uh, mm -hmm. F-trace as well. So yeah. it will actually interact with the uh, kernel. <laughs> but we do, that's the format. In fact, actually sometimes, it sounds like you're looking at, <coughs> from my idea is Babel traces, you have all these tools that get, get out um, the data. And I think this might be where we might work on the same goal, but yeah. different aspects of it. Um, Sounds like you're looking at all the tra tracing format files, and I, I, I'd be happy to make trace command write CTF. I mean, I have no problem. It's just okay. it's been on the to-do list. It's just the time, it's just never got there. Um, but what I'm actually focusing on my side is enabling and disabling the tracers. Are you working on doing that? Not as part of Babel trace. Yeah. So Babel so trace is really like once you have the, your traces. Right. So this actually, I think we could work together, and this is where I think we are not. Do over, well, there's a small overlap, but I think there's overlap, but I think we are two different focuses. Yeah. I'm looking at getting, having something like if you load LTTNG, having a library, perf, LTTNG, ftrace, anything that's a, a BPF or I mean, mm -hmm. have something that could enable, disable a tool, to, a library that enables and disables the tracing to pull out the data. And I haven't really looked at formatting the data. So it looks like Babel will, use, like the two could be combined where like uh, the unified tracing platform is supposed to be enabling, disabling tracing. And then using Babel Trace, to, uh, lib Babel Trace, to uh, to be able to unify the data that's once it's collected. Yeah. So it sounds like we are actually so not complementary. Yes. Yeah. So I guess like lib trace event was more the, the trace processing. Uh, it does. It did both, here. but yeah, I also have a lib f trace that does it. And um, actually, I, maybe I'll break that up into a way of uh, doing that. I don't. I don't even mind if we change it to use CTF and right. I have no problem with that. I just need manpower. Um, but right, but yes, I've been very, very concerned about um, <clears throat> backward compatibility. I mean, I, uh, they know I'm always yelling at them, saying, "No, we got to do it this way because we." It's always looking forward, like how can this be? How can we extend it without breaking it? So I always have options. I always have extendability, 
to be able to extend things. So trace, to trace that DAT file, uh, we were, were actually, it's at version 6. Okay. Version 6 was written at trace command 1.0. Okay. And one, two, three, four, five were all like one, two, three, four, five were all development processes. And once I hit six, I haven't changed it since. We were thinking of going to seven because there's one thing I don't know is, is compressed. We have the file compressed. That's the one thing that's not. Once you make it compressed, old old trace command will never be able to won't know how to read it. Mm -hmm. So that's the only difference. That's the one step of changing breaking compatibility. But is that considered part of the kernel ABI or? No, 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 oh, no, okay. no, no. This is all user-space ABI. The the kernel ABI is there. It's it's actually um, uh, the libk buffer. Okay. We have a libk buffer that trace command uses, and that's actually in the kernel tree uh, that perf uses. Or perf, that not perf. I think no, not perf, but perf uh, f trace. Perf f trace has it. So that libk buffer tells you how to read the f trace ring buffer from binary data that gets pulled out of the kernel. Okay. And that's okay. ABI. So then, then you can do it. So, so that works for ftrace. Uh, I'm not so sure how we're going to handle, for instance, until PT is something that I've looked a bit into. Um, and I mean, there's a, a lot of tooling that's open source to deal with that. Um, but I'm like, uh, I'm sort of unsure if those trace formats, those native trace formats of, uh, of, of Intel, are going to be supported in the future. Or are they going to change? So, if things can change. I think it makes sense to ship um, a source as part of that tree that's going to be maintained, say, by Intel. Um, and the same would apply if Ftrace was to change its format, then it could update its Babel trace source and the rest would continue to work as is. Um, <coughs> the other thing is uh, having common uh, clock sources. So LTTNG uses, for instance, clock monotonic, it provides a boot ID, and it provides an offset to epoch. So basically, you can interpret a cycle count as real uh, wall time. This is not so true with uh, a lot of hardware, hardware traces. And so this is like an open question. We're not sure how to infer that information from existing traces uh, and whether we can work with other tracer author to make, sur make sure that clocks are described as part of their trace format or whichever other way. Um, so this is more an open question. I don't know if anything has been done. Yeah, the, it's funny because the clock um, in uh, libftrace or whatever, the trace command is just a counter. We end up, we're working on ways to, and actually it's defined in the libtrace event, uh, which is in the kernel, which is, uh, and we, I think we're, we're actually working, we're working on changing, because right now lib, libtrace event is not, we're working on making that into an ABI, uh, actual hard coding into a true, you know, once we send it as a library, yeah, you know, it's called libtrace event. But once it goes out as to the uh, distributions, where it, it's got to be stable, we can't. And we're still actually working on some of this um, to make it more. Just it's a number, and you could define. We actually created a new uh, ABI. What, what's it called? Tep, the print one. So that's a, the one that you just did. Uh, the tep print format. Yeah, we have a tep print format. Uh, tep is the tracing event uh, parser. Yeah, trace event parser, and so how to parse the events okay. data. So um, the TEP um, for print format, what it does is you pass in um, basically printf format, and then you could pass in, you know, you could use the uh, star dot, the precision, and then say, okay, this is going to, the field is, I want the time, I want, you know, the timestamp, this and this. So basically to the interface, the timestamp is just a number, but you could, the tool could pass in a print format thing to define, to make that number into a precision, to truncate it or whatever. You could say, okay, but do. Can you relate that to wall time or, or is it like well, a way the of cycle counter? And uh, no, uh, okay, here's the thing about trace event uh, or F trace and is the fact that the clock is uh, definable. There's, you can actually, there's a trace clock in the trace FS file system. Mm -hmm. So you can make it, give me cycles, give me, so it's just a number. So it's not, yes. So that brings a problem. I mean, I if we can have information in the trace metadata about what configuration has been used for that <laughs> clock, then Babel Trace would know if it can correlate with other tracers or not. That would be useful. Okay, I'm trying to remember. Do we have an option in trace the trace data that records? Yeah, we record what clock is used. 
uh, yeah, it's, uh, the trace.fl, yeah, we actually have, uh, uh, yeah, we, we actually record, we read the trace clock, whatever's, so if it says local, thing, we actually say this is what the clock is. So at least if, that shouldn't change, I guess. Yeah, that's part, that's kernel ABI. So I guess that's something that we could say, you know, hey, Linus, this can't change. So yes, you actually could tell you what clock was used uh, for what number it is. And that, that's actually one thing we changed. Before, we based off the format depending on what clock was used, and we realized that for a library, that's not what we wanted. We wanted the user to be able to be more flexible. That's mm -hmm. why we created a trace format to do the change. But you could ask, what clock is this? Mm -hmm. And then make your decision. That's actually what trace command does. It now does what clock was used, and then makes its decision on how to format it based off of what clock it was. And, and the library doesn't uh, set the policy anymore. Before, okay. yeah. But do you have any way to uh, preserve that offset to, to uh, wall time or? Uh, no, well, we could set an option to, like in the, but yeah. right now actually we're working on that on our, uh, um, for uh, Kernel Shark 2.0, we're doing tracing between VMs. Okay. And we need a way to do um, synchronization between the two talks. Or we're working on at least synchronizations between uh, two basically tracers. Like, you know, yeah. one's in the VM, one's in the uh, host. And I've learned that you know the Intel architecture allows you to have them be two completely different clocks with two different frequencies and everything. Mm -hmm. So you can't just uh, assume that, that one they're the same. Yeah. that they're the same. Yeah, or even at the same frequency, they, there's a drift. <laughs> so do you have any solution uh, for that, or <sighs> something on the table? Or? Yeah, we're, that's actually one of our. Uh, we're discussing that we have a P2P program. Well, are you familiar with the P2P? Not not peer-to-peer -peer protocol, but there's a time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ours is the same time as the Yes. Time. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're do, we're, 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 that was one thing. One thing we wanted to originally try to do is use trace points or trace events within the host and kernel and then tag it, tag it. But right now we're using VSOC, it's, uh, VSOC as our communication, and VSOC is very bloated, so trying to get the two trace points where the switch happens is extremely difficult. Mm. And you could have, like, it's, you know, preemption is enab enabled, so you can actually take your trace point, then preempt it and come back, and then it switches. So. <laughs> It was very inaccurate. When we tried this, it was extremely inaccurate. We couldn't find places where it was done with interrupts disabled, and yeah. So right. that's yeah, that's a thing that we're working on. Okay. I think I'm just about out of time. The the last oh. point was basically uh, um, making tra trace analysis tools uh, tracer agnostic. This is really an open discussion. But I mean, um, I've talked with people from Trace Compass, um, and I think Kernel Shock would be open to using Babel Trace just to read any number. Oh of no, uh, yeah. That's that's trace our plan, um, but the rest making like making a BPF trace uh, scripts work with that is a really an open question. Something that we discussed yesterday. Um, so, I don't know if people have any ideas to throw out there, how you could uh, actually run those scripts, which are meant to to, to run real time, uh, not, well, real time, but on a live system, um, from a post mortem trace, um, either through a Sandbox BPF interpreter that would try to recreate the context uh, that was available to the BPF probe, or you know, whichever other solution. Okay. Well, now, <coughs> right now it's been a discussion. This right now, everything that's happened right now could have been done by us two just getting together, <laughs> a few other people. Um, anyone have questions, ideas mm -hmm. about our discussion or topics? Basically, the idea is this. Uh, how many people think there's too many tracers in the world? <laughs> okay, so uh, basically the point is this, you know, what I've learned was that the reason why there's so many different tracers and we tried the unified tracing buffer, you know, we had the, you know, <clears throat> the ring buffer wars, uh, the one ring buffer to rule them all. Uh, that failed miserably. Uh, we there's now the LTTNG ring buffer, F-trace ring buffer, perf ring buffer. I think they're even trying to, well, we have a print K ring buffer now. Uh, we're doing a lot of ring buffers. And someone's like, why can't we just do one? And when you work, okay, I've, who here has written a ring buffer? <laughs> okay. Uh, a long time ago, I had the predecessor to F-trace was log dev, and I uh, tried to get it into the kernel, and this is it around 2004 time frame, and Thomas Fleischner said, you know, everyone and their grandmother wrote a ring buffer in the kernel. <laughs> uh, we don't need it. You know, you write it, you throw it away, 
figure. Right? But it's like, well, you know, why is everyone rewriting the world? Well, once you start working on this, and this is something Matthew is very well aware of, the thing about tracing is you don't want to be, you don't want to affect the system. You want the Heisenberg issue low as possible. So you got to have a ring buffer that is lockless. You have the ring buffer that's extremely fast. You have to have something that can record and get out zero copies. This means you got to do a lot of tricks. And the ring buffers, yes, is raised. Um, but I'll give you this. There's all good requirements. But you also forgot sequence and correlated time. Uh, Most of what? those are all exactly the right things you need in order to lower the noise you get. But the big problem is when you try and put in some kind of correlated sequence or correlated time, and trying to get that usually throws you at a lock. Yeah. By the way, can you stand up so that they can see who is talking? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, well, the thing is, what we usually do is per CPU ring buffers, and then you don't have to really worry about. The, I mean, actually. I have an issue with the F trace ring buffer. I know Matthew had did it differently. I didn't really agree with his uh, solution, but uh, I, but his actually can't handle it. If I get if an interrupt happens when a event is being recorded, because it's lockless and also I don't disable interrupts, I disable preemption. That's the only thing. Uh, just so it makes things easier. Uh, so I disable preemption. But if an interrupt goes off and a trace event happens while the recording happens, the time since my timestamps are done to keep it as small as possible, it's a differential and it just puts in zero. So it's saying that if you happen here, now you have a bunch of events that happen that are all at the same timestamp. Uh, I have solutions that came up, but they all are buggy. <laughs> so I'm trying to find a way to make sure because it's really, really tricky to get that it's correct. Zero copy and lockless and all the rest of it you can do is when you start trying to figure out which came first that it gets harder. Yeah. Well, and it's fine. It's, it's, it's ordered because it, it comes in. But you're right. When something happens, I d uh, time that's where an issue is. But listen, we're kind of getting off tangent here. Um, the thing about the ring buffers and everything that I said, the reason why there's so many is also we found out there's different, different perspectives. Um, the question came up earlier, why is there, you know, why are we doing histograms when BPF could do it? But when the histogram code came out, Alexei was like, you know, BPF can do this. And I always say to people, I'm like, when you, I, I used the example of, uh, or the analogy of bash versus C. You know, when you need to do something real quick uh, and you just don't care, you just run in, you write your bash, you, you start doing bash. And once it gets a little bit more complex, and like, oh, wow, this is actually a useful feature I need to constantly use over and over again, extend it, it gets more complicated. Maintaining it in bash, it becomes a nightmare. Writing a true C program is where to go. That's basically the difference between F-Trace and uh, BPF. I tell people, if you just need something quick, F-Trace is there. Just, I just want to do something once or a couple things, or do some things, I, mean, I, do so, I use it all the time. I've yet really needed to, I have not needed to use EPPF because F-Trace has done everything I've needed, but then again, I'm the author. I, if, if there's something I think F-Trace needs, I just kind of write the code and change it. So uh, I've always told people F-Trace was written for me, not you. Um, <laughs> that's, but the point what I'm saying was, um, we have some different perspectives, that's why we have so many different tools. What's sad part is, one tool will have something and another tool doesn't. And this is not the Unix world where we had AIX, Sun, you know, and everything else, the BSD, all proprietary systems where, you know, everyone was trying to outdo the other. And then you came up with a bunch of Unix systems that were incompatible, and that's why they died. They didn't crash. And everyone says Linux, the fork of Linux will kill it. No, because the difference between back then and Linux is Linux is open source, GPL. When you see a feature that someone else has that you like, you can incorporate it in your own stuff. Or better, be able to lock in, hook. So the idea here, uh, kind of like what I said, I think this is where we're working. Their time, uh, Jeremy's proposal is we have a bunch of tracers, and we're trying to get them, you know, get a tool. You just get a tool and say, hey, I could use, you know, this library, and I could read all the data formats, and I could put together, I could take perf uh, cache counting as LTG, uh, uh, module loading or something, maybe F-trace function tracing, because F-trace function, uh, the F-trace ring buffer was made for function tracing. So it was made to be as, you know, for that constant pulling where perf was made for more for profiling. So if you've done perf function tracing, you, you won't get as much data as much as you will with the F-trace. So it's, there was a focus there. Um, but if we, you could 
say if you got all these data formats, you want to correlate them. That's why we come up with the question, timestamps. That's a huge problem. And that's something that we have to work together with, and that's one of the discussions. So anyone here a time expert? You are. Good. Worked on GPS. Okay, well, maybe you have some ideas that you can help us. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it, in a particular, you summed it up well. I mean, per CPU works really well if it's all happening on that CPU. When you have to start work, work when you have to start worrying about correlating things between CPUs, and especially when you have to cross from one socket to another, and there's huge cross transport delays, um, the issue gets fraught. Um, the best you can usually do is try and attempt an approximation of what you've got, but trying to get everything strictly ordered, I don't think is possible. Yeah. yeah. Please, please, like, uh, if we, Mike. Sorry. Here, 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 before you're fairly close to heads, heads, heads up, ready? Sorry. Get a phone, I don't want to crash your phone. Um, fundamentally, relativity says there is no cons single consistent ordering, for g given the speed of modern machines and distance between sockets and so on and so forth. So it's an impossible problem. There's, you can only come up with candidate orderings, uh, all as valid as each other. A and approximations. Mm. And, and like I said, it doesn't even matter if you're on the same CPU. Like I mentioned, we're trying to trace between guest and host. And I mean, I didn't realize that was a new technology. I, I, I just assumed that they had the same frequency. I was wrong. You could actually set up, and it actually does that by default, I think, is the guest will have a different frequency than the host. <laughs> so you can't even, you know, the same CPU. You just change context, and not only that, your timestamps are not going to correlate. Um, that makes things very difficult, especially when you want to show when things happen between guests and hosts exactly. So yes, we need help. Um, Linux trace devel at veeger.kernel.org and someone, I can write that down, hold on. Um, it'll be in the notes. We would like to have people to um, subscribe. Please, this is okay. Linux Trace Tavel, please subscribe. Go to vigor.kernel.org or yeah, and it'll be a mail. You can find it. Subscribe to it. This is where at least um, we do our all our development for lib or trace command and for um, kernel shark. It's open for if LTTA, LTTA you have your own mailing list. Um, if any, it's this is supposed to be generic. It's not. It says it's not trace command. Devel. It's not ftrace devel. It's supposed to be Linux trace devel. We're encouraging anyone to do that. I've told you to, when you do the, um, uh, what's called, tracing summit, please post to at least the users and devel so we know when it happens. I'm trying to get more people to subscribe here. This is where we do all our talking. Please come here, because this is where we post our patches for time synchronization. This is where we do our discussions on time synchronization. If you were, you have, it sounds like you have a lot more experience in this than we do. We really would appreciate any insight that you see on that? Um, anyone else have anything? So, uh, so basically, I talked about what uh, Jeremy was doing a little bit. What I'm focusing on now is I want to have a way to not just read the data, but use the data. So I want a lib perf. I want a lib EBF or something like that. I want a lib LTTNG. I want anything that could say, hey, I'm available. To, you know, I want a library that tells me so a tool, any tool, you can write a tool or Python script to say what's available. And then from Python or whatever, say, okay, I want to start this function, Tracy. I want to start you know, maybe abstracting out what you ask, or maybe just say, hey, maybe get a single ABI <coughs> that will work with, so maybe like have a unified tracing platform, maybe a lib UTP that will <coughs> then figure out, oh, perf is available, ftrace is available, LTT is available, and be able to just get the data that you want figure out the time synchronizations and everything else. And this is, like I said, I'm trying to figure out how to do this, how to get this done. It's not easy. You've got a bunch of different ways, different ideas, different mentalities, and I'm trying to sum it up together. Instead of reinventing a wheel, I'm like, we have a lot of great functionality, a lot of great tools. That should be a platform. It shouldn't be a perf, a, you know, a trace compass. Right? These things should be able to use, they should, we should separate that, have the user interface 
Some people like using trace command more than perf or trace compass more than kernel shark or whatever. <coughs> That's fine. But the, everything else that of the, uh, the functionality should be a separation, should be abstracted out. And that's what I'm working on. That's what I'm trying to get people to do. So that's my pitch. Uh, if anyone wants to help out, have any ideas? It's always hard after the break. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the, I, that, that sums up what I'm trying to do. So at least if anything, I'm focusing on what I'm trying to go. So if you have ideas, there's also uh, Linux trace users as well. If you want, or if you're, I try to post things, announcements if you want to see. Feel free to post announcements for, you know, Babel Trace on the Linux Trace users if you or uh, to get more users. It's open. Push it out. Um, Trying to see what else we have next. We might be early, but well, I have twelve forty-four, so I have like ten more minutes. But <laughs> before we go to the next thing, unless uh, well, I'll probably hold off because I know Babel Trace or or I think BPF Trace is coming up next or something. So um, I don't. I know people are going to come in at that time because I'm sure this, this room will probably get crowded there. Anything else you want to discuss, or is there any ideas? Because that was basically why I was trying to come up with ideas. And speaking of the man, yeah, uh, do you have to, do you have the mic over there too? Yep. How much does architecture affect what you're going to be able to do with the universal interface? The the, the underlying hardware that you have available. Um, well, that depends on, like I said, ideally I want a libperf that deals with it. I want a lib trace, f trace that deals with it. So the idea, it's kind of like what you showed before, also how Linux is architectured, or even GCC is architectured. A lot of times I, I say, let's look at, I use GCC. You have um, how GCC could handle all the different architectures. There's, the, it, it compiles it into a single interface, and then you could read it, kind of similar with Babel Trace. So I want to API, I, I want to, I want an API that will then talk to different other APIs that will deal with the underlying infrastructure. So that's what I'm kind of working on, trying to figure out how to get together. I'm trying to find the people who'd be interested in it. Anyone interested in working on this? Yeah. Uh, one, uh, one note, you might find Binutils more interesting, or, or LD in particular, more interesting to look at than GCC because it can compile in multiple targets at the same time, uh, which you yeah. can't do with, G with GCC front ends or back ends as far as I'm aware. Okay, well, I haven't actually looked at the code. I just yeah. looked at the mm. idea of yeah. it. It's even, even more unusual with shell scripts, shell scripts generating code and pasting it together and all sorts of things like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's basically just saying, okay, we have the idea, like, have a way of... I figure out the, some of the basic things that we need, I'm trying to think of more that you might need uh, from the uh, API. So say if perf, I would say, does it exist? Does perf, is perf enabled? F-trace is it enabled, is LTT is it enabled? Does the API, that I ha if I had a lib LTTNG, could I say, does it exist? Um, one, one thing I'm thinking, uh, perhaps there would also be value in creating something that does more or orchestration of tracing across various machines. So between a host and a guest, but also across various guest, uh, machines that are uh, interacting on a cluster. And perhaps there might be more value added uh, in doing this orchestration than doing the uh, uh, unified tracing platform on, from the point of view of a single uh, uh, OS. Uh, yes, actually, I've been thinki thinking that too. Right now, I'm just trying to say a way of just trying to get the, the actual there. But we could also say, hey, are we at a cloud? Are we have a, you know, is a service available? Uh, we could extend this into services um, and then build up on that. Uh, once we get kind of like something unified, I think it shouldn't be too hard to extend it. Um, adding another way and then we have to think about this, but is there any other uh, ideas other than? Are you trying to, oh, sure. yep. okay. uh, are you trying to do something that's capable? Like, you want to trace scale switch, I don't care which tracer does it, I just want all yes. the scale switches in a yes. file somewhere. Or any, yeah, any sketch switch, it, it, it could determine or, which Or whatever, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. it would use whatever is configured on that system. And yeah, it will try maybe a few from and yeah. figure out which one's the best, or it could be the API could, or maybe you could say I want to do this one, maybe have a way of saying just, I just care about the ftrace version of it, or do perf version of it, or if I don't care, it just finds one. So yes, yeah. I want to, I kind of want to abstract out uh, people caring about what's going on. I mean, you care about what's going on, but what's it's it's a tool. 
And I've always said about um, F-Trace, F-Trace is a second class citizen in the Linux kernel. I keep telling them that. F-Trace is, is trying not to be there. The important thing is whatever the work getting done, your database acts, you know, when your customer comes in onto your system and you get a response, you do a Google search or something, it comes up and you get something real quick. That is important. The tracing of that is a debugging tool. So it's a utilization tool and people don't care what debugger it is. They just care about their reaction to happen and just give me something, it's not working the way I expect it, why? They want a utility. This is why it doesn't really matter. So I always say F-Trace is a second class citizen. It, we, everything works fine and try to give as much info to people and try to stay out of their way when doing it. I, th I think one of the important thing to tackle with this uh, unified tracing uh, platform is to replicate what is being done by tracers on other platforms, which is basically not requiring, not requiring people to be kernel experts in order to know what events they need to trace. So kind of having higher level profiles, saying I'm interested in I.O., I'm interested in scheduling, uh, and so forth and so uh, So having those profiles at this unified tracing platform might, might make sense. Yeah, but that's, to me, that's the second stage. What I want <laughs> right now we're looking, yeah, it's good to look forward, but I like, we need to get the lib, well, you have a lib uh, LTT, NG? Yeah, yeah, so you have, so if I had a tool that just wants to interact, I could just write a tool, great. Uh, I'm working right now on F-Trace. I need one for perf. BPF might get something, I don't know, well, BPF's a little more complicated because that's writing scripts and tools and stuff like that. Um, but having something that could implement all this stuff and I'm trying to get it so the user doesn't care what tracer they're using. <laughs> so if it's there, it's our job to make it easy for them. And we should be working together to try to make sure that that's the features are there and not be fighting about, oh, I want LTT, oh, I want BPF, or I want, the, you know, that's, that's just squabbling among us. And it makes great L LWN articles, but other than that, let's see here. I still got six minutes to waste. <laughs> I would jump ahead like I said, um, if Brandon Greg, I, I think you're next, right, Brandon? No, I'm not next. You're not next? No. Who's He's next? At the end. What was it? He's just oh, before lunch. So you have two minutes. Actually, you're next. Oh, you're next. No, actually, I, I'm in my field right now. Okay. So you want to go to uh, Alex or to Peter for a test? Hmm? I think he just stepped up. He yes. Up. Yeah, well, actually, uh, yeah, 12. Yeah, because I'm supposed to be till 12.44, although I think I, yeah. And so I have five more minutes, yes. Oh, stretchy. I keep looking over at you because you, I'm waiting for you to comment on something. Anything else? Anyone else have any questions, concerns, help? Yes. You talked about not wanting to create noise at the bottom end. One of the things that tends to create noise, especially in tracing, is the cache effects, especially at high rate, how yes. do you try and address those in a universal uh, right way? Well, that's not up to the universal pla tracing platform to address that. That's up to the tracers themselves to address that. And you have any ideas on how the best to handle cash? Well, I mean, we try, mm, that's always been an issue. <laughs> so, I mean, I've, I've seen the effects. I mean, one time, weir weirdly, when I first enabled trace events in the kernel and with the trace points and everything else, where it would actually inject code at the bottom um, you know, it doesn't, in unlikelies, uh, we had, uh, the way trace events work is the fact that there's just a no-op there, and we use jump labels to actually convert the no-op to jump to the tracing code, but the tracing code is, when you create a trace event, or a trace point, actually, when you create a trace point, you're actually injecting code into the hot path, I suppose, or into, well, it's not the hot path, but into those functions at the bottom of the functions. So we use the unlikely, so GCC will actually move them out of the way, so they're always, you just have a no-op at the bottom of the functions, but if you have multiple functions, it's going to put a gap between them. And I wanted to see what the cache effect was of trace events, so I compiled without, I turned off all tracing, so no trace events was there, ran Hackbench like uh, 100 times, took a bunch of the average number of it, enabled trace events with it off, ran Hackbench a bunch of times, and it got about 2% speed up. Wow. <laughs> 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 yep. And I, did it multiple times and I got the same effect. I'm like, what the hell? It just happened to move the cache better. <laughs> yeah, I didn't notice the same thing, but when you do actual useful tracing, 
you end up writing in a ring buffer in our, our post-processing approaches. And this, I mean, if you have a shared ring buffer between CPUs, you will destroy your, your system's <laughs> performance. So first CPU approach is good, but then you have to size the ring buffer correctly. So, I mean, you might uh, want to hit the cache rather than memory and things like that. And as I predicted, the room is filling up, waiting for the next. <laughs> <laughs> so we got two more, well, actually we'll start. Who's, where's, there he is. Um, I guess you can take. Oh, down here? No worries. So thank you. Ready? Yep. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. My name is Alistair Robertson, and I'm going to be talking about BPF Trace today. Um, but before we get started, I made a promise to my boss that I would plug my company, Yellow Brick Data, because they have very kindly paid me to come here to this conference this whole week, despite it being nothing to do with my day job. Um, so Yellow Brick is an all-flash SQL database um, designed for very quickly processing complex analytical queries. Um, on petabytes of data. So there we go. Um, on to BPF Trace. BPF Trace is a project which I started in my spare time uh, just under three years ago now. <laughs> um, and for those who don't know, it's a high level tracing language for Linux, surprisingly enough, powered by BPF. Um, more specifically, it uses the newer features that have gone into BPF over the last several years. Um, the stuff that is sometimes known as eBPF, or the Enhanced Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, I'm not going to talk about BPF, the internals of BPF today. If you're interested in that, I'm sure you already know, but there's the BPF microconference on Wednesday where people will probably do that stuff. So today, what I am going to go over is first give a brief introduction to BPF Trace, just to make sure we're all on the same page about what it is. 
Um, and later on, we'll talk about what we've been working on in the past year and our plans for the future. So if you install BPF Trace, you get a command line interface to it, a command line tool, BPF Trace. You can use the dash E option and then pass a string containing your BPF tracing program. Um, same, same kind of thing as awk, dash E script. So a BPF trace script consists of three main parts. First, you always have a probe definition that just says what events you want to be tracing on your computer. Secondly, between a pair of forward slashes, you have an optional predicate, which is just an expression. If it evaluates to true, we continue and execute our probe. If it evaluates to false, we just ignore this event. And finally, we've got the action block, which is a series of statements that just define what actions we want to take when our event fires. So in this case, we're attaching to a K probe, which means we attach to a function inside the Linux kernel. So every time the do fork function is run inside Linux, if it comes from a PostgreSQL process, then we print hello back to the user. Simple. Um, printf, in this example, is a BPF trace built-in function. Now, there's actually a whole load of them, various types of outputs or performing in-kernel aggregations like histograms or statistics. Um, we've got a bunch of built-in variables as well to get process ID, timestamps, anything you might find useful when doing tracing. Um, there's a number of different probe types we can attach to. We talked about key probes already. U probes are the equivalent to attach to any user land function. We can also attach to user land statically defined trace points kernel trace points, and various perf events like timers, software events, hardware events, and watch points are a new one as well. Each of these probe types, as well as a few other BPF trace features, has slightly different kernel version requirements, just depending on when the ability to attach BPF programs to these events was added to Linux. So technically, you can start using BPF trace with Linux 4.1 um, to trace some K probes, although you might there'll be a lot of missing features there. So the more recent kernel version you're using, the more features you're gonna get, the better experience you'll have. Um, this one here is a slightly more complicated example of a BPF trace script. What it's doing is attaching to a kernel trace point, and we've got an, a wildcard up there. So we're attaching to every kernel trace point that starts in the syscall to center star. So it's attaching to every system call on your computer. And we're defining a BPF map called MyCount, which is keyed on the exact probe name, so sysread or syswrite. And we're counting, we're producing an individual count for every system call. So this script here is essentially like strace c, so that system-wide count of system calls. When you control C your BPF trace program, it dumps out all information it's aggregated inside a kernel back to userland for reading. If you get something like this. So that, that was my very brief introduction to BPF Trace. Um, if you are interested in learning more, there's documentation on our GitHub repository. We've got a one-liner tutorial, a full reference guide with descriptions of every feature of the language. Brendan has written a lot of blog posts about it. Um, and there's a number of BPF Trace contributors in the room today, so feel free to come and talk to any of us later. So now for what we've been doing in BPF Trace in the past year. Actually, um, what we've been doing in BPF Trace since the last Linux Plumbers, which was November 2018, so not quite a year, because that, that was when Matthias Marcini, another BPF Trace maintainer, gave a talk back, uh, back in Vancouver. No. So since then, we've had 298 pull requests merged in from 48 individuals, changing over 20,000 lines of code, a lot of it being in tests and documentation. BPF Trace has been packaged on a bunch of popular Linux distributions, and it's also available, and it's known as being built and packaged internally at a number of large companies made available for their employees too. So all, all of these packages, both open source and internal to companies, mean that it's easier than ever for people to start using BPF Trace, and I imagine its growth is gonna continue to accelerate over the next year. So now I've just got a list of a few big features that went in since November last year that I wanted to talk about. Um, first one is, our compiler now has error context. Um, we record what line number the error message is on, character position on that line, we, we print out and underline where the offending code is. Um, if you're just writing simple one-liners, it's not too big of a problem if there was no context, but as people start writing more complicated BPF trace scripts and reusable tools, then it can become, become a bit of a nightmare if there's no line numbers. 
So that, that's just a non-controversial improvement there. Um, EPF Trace has always had unit tests, but there were no there was no end-to-end -end testing. So we've produced our own Python-based test library and our own test definition uh, format. It makes it very easy to to write full end-to-end -end tests, so we can be more sure when we're developing BPF Trace that nothing breaks. Um, now onto more more user visible tracing features. Um, BPF Trace has now got native support for IP addresses, both IPv4 and IPv6, um, using the new N2P built-in function. You specify what type of IP address it is, bit of data that's holding the IP address, and it produces a human readable string. So this just makes it a lot easier to write tracing tools that trace networking applications. And we've got, we've got a number of new ones that have been added to repository, maybe taking advantage of it already. Microphone? The, the testing ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you considered using uh, something standard like TAP? Um, I've not actually been too involved in the, the, the testing bit. Um, I, I haven't heard of TAP, so I'm sorry. You, it, it, you yeah. think it would be yeah. suitable for this kind of testing? Yeah. yeah? looking into. Okay, this is another one I touched on briefly earlier. A new watch point probe type has been added to BPF Trace that allows you to essentially watch a piece of memory. You, you give it a memory address and length of this memory block and whether you want to watch for read events or write events, and then when that block of memory is changed, our probe fires. Um, so this one is both work that has been done and work that needs to be done in the future, as obviously specifying memory addresses like this isn't ideal for users. You'd want to just put the name of a variable or something like that in there, and BPF Trace will automatically look up its address and how big the variable is, and so that users don't have to mess around uh, with text addresses. Question two, also, um, is this, I mean, BPF Trace, I think it's root user only? Yes. Okay. So then you should have like proc KL sims or it would take, or I guess from user space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we are, we, we do use proc KL sims for K probes and stuff. Yeah, because proc KL sims, should, I believe it has, vari does variables exist or expect, I believe variables are, in, are they? No, but no, they're not, no, they're not. Good. They're just functions, are they? Oh, wait, global variables. global variables? Yeah, global variables are, but yeah, I guess if, yeah, hmm. so. But then again, you might have trouble then the non-local, non-global variables if you want to watch point or something. That's local variables might be well, 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 yeah. But then you have a lot of duplicates. But I'm saying local variables might be variable. But I'm saying is if you have most of the times I tried. That's right. I tried using KL sims once for one of the K probes things I did, and I found out that there's actually a very limited amount of global variables. Most of the things you care about are not global. <laughs> They're like like I want to see this variable. Oh, it's like allocated and it's. Uh, allocate at runtime, and you got to go out and find it, and that's not in KL Sims. I guess that's what. Oh, it's missing none. Well, I think, no, I think there is some. No, I, I it's only, no they should. They're there. Well, yeah. Mm. Right, static variables are there. I have to repeat what you just said. So, yeah, so you have static variables are there, um, but yeah, I think. That's the issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was actually talking to some of the Facebook guys yesterday, um, and I heard there might be some problems. Uh, was it along that line of stuff that, that you were thinking of? Um, do you have a mic? Mike? Yeah. Does someone else have a throw? Where's the other throw of a mic? Is that one back there? Or did it? We should have another one. Hello? Okay, cool. Oh, uh, yeah, local variables are tricky because for. Um, BPF trace, you need to know the. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so local variables are tricky because for BPF trace, you need to know the um, virtual address ahead of time, and you don't really have access to the frame pointer. So even if you had the offset from the dwarf stuff, it may be really tricky to get the frame pointer uh, just to get the offset into like you know the function. 
Uh, so I'm not really sure what to do about that. You could do like some crazy stuff with like attach a probe to the entry point of the function, grab the frame pointer, calculate the offset, and install another probe. But then you could race with it, and you can't really pause execution in a BPF program. You can't install another probe in uh, BPF program context. Oops, uh, wait, uh, right. Uh, there could easily be multiple simultaneously live instances of a, gi of a given local variable. So e even then, you'd have to, you'd have problems. If, but if it was recursive, you're going to be repeatedly installing a probe at the same at the same address. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a flaming nightmare. We it, don't do recursion in the kernel. We try not to. No, I'm sure, I'm sure it happens. It happens in every software system. <laughs> it, it, it's always limited. Mm, oh yeah, it's still it's non-zero though. Yeah, for local variables, it looks like uh, it's going to be really hairy. So I'm going to probably do the global stuff first and then see if I get any inspiration. I don't know. Maybe not. Um, I noticed that you are hash including a C file, a C header. Was that on a previous uh, yes. slide? Oh, yes, there. So how does this work? Are you compiling the probe definition into C code and then building it with uh, compiling it to um, BPF? No, or? no. So what happens is that we, we use libclang internally. And yes. libclang um, parses their includes and structs and converts it into a format that BPF trace understands. And then. And again, which format is that? Just an internal BPF trace thing. OK. So wait, is that a, uh, so is that the, the netsocket.h? So what, what that, is that coming, that's coming from the kernel itself? Yep, yeah, that's sta standard kernel headers. <laughs> yeah. We have BTF support. It, did we There's merge a pull it? request. It hasn't been merged yet. So we have a pull request for BTF support, so we can just use BTF for that information instead. Hmm. In fact, Jury might be here somewhere, so we can talk to him yeah. about it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Jury. So one question there, Brendan. So with, B with BTF support, does that mean that arg0 will automatically know that is a struct sock? So we haven't merged it yet, but I would like uh, there to be a, another type, because arg0 is always a uin64 type, so I'd like there to be a different type of arg0, so like arg0 underscore t, to say a typed arg0 using BTF so that it knows the type. And so you could then choose to write programs that, so you didn't have to cast things like we're doing here, because it would know the type. So that's our uh, BTF can BT or CTF, which one? BTF, BPF type format. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, is that our, uh, well, uh, include some uh, uh, local, uh, what's the, uh, argument names or just type? It's a lot of information. Uh, Yung Hong Sung is here who coded it. It's, it's, it's built into the kernel, so, um, if I had a laptop, I could show some. Yeah, it's a lot of information, a lot of information about type format. Who can summarize it better than I can? Not me. <laughs> Is Jung Hung here? Entry can, entry can say. Okay, here we go. Ready? <laughs> hey! Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, so. BTF is a collection of type information plus some additional information. And like in this context, we kind of talked about two different uses of BTF. The first one, like this, re essentially replacing the need for system kernels, uh, system kernel headers, right? So like you won't need to do include NAT, SOC, and whatever. You can just dump essentially the BTF information contained within the kernel, generate like one big header file with like all the structs, including the internal ones that are not exposed normally. And that's, I think that's what we are talking about that like is landing soon, right? So we don't need uh, local headers, we just need BTF and then we can convert it to C. As for the function arguments, BTF also contains the type information. We probably can add the argument names, but uh, they are not there right now. And with that, probably and some more magic, you can, you can derive that like argument one for some specific kernel probe is of type skbuff and then just use it without casting. So uh, it's a uh, what's a subset of the dwarf. It can be. You can say so. Yes, we can okay. convert dwarf into BTF. Okay. Yeah. And also, Clank knows how to emit BTF directly for BPF programs. So like, there are two ways to get BTF, either through B dwarf to BTF conversion or directly generated by Clank. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we're done with watch points. Another one is, oh, no, sorry, we've got a question. Question about that. <laughs> Question, uh, is this going to be like a, a system tap replacement? Or how, uh, how it oh, is? that's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> Related to. Does anyone else want to answer that one? <laughs> well, system tap is in the kernel. Uh, that's a Red Hat basically only thing supported. So this is actually in the official kernel, so it's not a system tap replacement, but I believe functionality-wise, I think you probably can do most everything. I don't know, well, the problem with system tap also is it's, you put a, you're loading a kernel module into the kernel to do work. This is for like just-in-time compiling, right? So it's basically a BT, uh, BTF has its own bytecode that goes in the kernel and then it could also be optimized by just-in-time compiling. And it has strict, uh, uh, how you, would you say, uh, analysis, uh, verification. Yeah. yeah, it verifies the code, doesn't allow, currently doesn't allow loops, but has that been fixed yet? Have they done I, I think that has been fixed. Has that been yeah. fixed? Yeah, so I think now it, 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 it verifies that it's an ending loop, so it, not, it doesn't allow any infinite loops and various other things that, you know, the halting problem. So it checks, it, it's a limited functionality where system tap is full blown and you could cra easily crash the kernel with system tap if you could crash the kernel with BPF, that's a bug. <laughs> Is that correct? Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just one note, uh, system tap now has a BPF backend, so you can generate actually a BPF program that uh, is uh, run in kernel, but well, using C. Oh, you can still use your like sort of uh, system tap programs to run uh, uh, BPF programs and not like kernel memory. Hello, uh, Mike. Okay. Um, actually, Mike, why well, keep it? So, could, do you maintain system tap at all? No. Okay, I wasn't sure if you did or not. Uh, but no, one thing about would be interesting though is because a lot of people do use system tap. Okay, here's a question: How many people here actually use system tap? Got a few hands. Okay, and you, how many people here have like scripts that you don't want to modify that you use? Maybe a couple. Yes. So what would be really, really nice is the fact that System Tap does make an interface where the user land scripts turn into BPF code. Then you can actually use your old System Tap scripts for BPF. This kind of goes back to my own talk about the unified tracing platform. They should be, once the implementation and the user space should be two different things. And that's something I would like to see, actually. Okay. The next thing I wanted to talk about is that back in spring, someone came along on GitHub and asked for a way of using BPF trace programmatically. Um, so the initial, initial suggestions were to produce a kind of lib BPF trace, a C library that exposed some interfaces for, for, for calling function, BPF trace functions. Um, we decided not to go with that in, in, in the end because the internal architecture of BPF trace is not, it is ch it's changing a lot. We've got a lot of changes planned and we didn't want to have to restrict ourselves to maintaining a stable API when we don't know what it, we want it would, to look like in the future. Um, so what we went with instead is allowing people to specify dash f JSON and all formats will be output as JSON on the command line. Um, so instead of pretty printing histograms and map values, everything is just a, a JSON message. All right. Um, just a few more quick things I wanted to go over. We've added a way of running sub-processes out of BPF trace, R run a command and automatically start tracing it from the very beginning. Just makes stuff life a bit easier than having to start a command and BPF trace at the same time and get process IDs and all that sort of stuff. Um, we've added a way of listing BPF trace probes. If you're not sure exactly what you want to be tracing, you can do BPF trace dash L and stick some wildcards in there to see what is available on your system. We've added better support for tracing Go programs because Go, Go's calling convection, uh, <laughs> convention is for passing arguments on the stack rather than in registers as we currently expect. So we've added a few new built-ins for accessing stack arguments. Um,
Yes, future stuff. <laughs> um, so actually, let's not talk about that because I think we know what we're doing on those two things. Stuff we're not sure about um, is potentially adding support for new CPU architectures in the future. So in the past year, we added ARM64 support, which is fairly easy. You just needed a few register remappings compared to AMD64. 32-bit um, architectures will be a bit tougher because BPF Trace is just written expecting 64-bit support. Um, we do have a proof of concept ARM 32-bit build kind of working, we think, but it would need a bit of work to productionize it if people are actually find that useful. Um, so we, we, we try and keep up to date with LLVM versions, which is a bit annoying, but we may not have to do that if we go for the fourth option on this list, which is to swap out, instead of compiling to LLVM bytecode and then getting LLVM to produce BPF bytecode for us, we just directly admit BPF bytecode and re remove the LLVM dependency altogether. That, that's something people have been requesting a lot, especially to be able to use BPF trace on embedded systems. Yep. Um, and then I guess just any other features or suggestions that people would have. By the way, real quick, um, if anyone else wants to help out, there is uh, Etherpad, Etherpad tracing up there. Um, if you, I'm doing it right now, but someone else wants to jump in and help out, especially when I'm talking or listening to someone, I leave out things. So this is important for the notes for the summary. So feel free, anyone could go to that link and edit. It's uh, right there, I'll see if you can read it. I'll make it bigger. Okay, testing microphone, sounds good. Thank you, this discussion is on BPF tracing tools. And Alistair just talked about BPF trace. I've been maintaining this diagram to keep my head around what's going on with the different traces. As Stephen mentioned earlier, there are too many traces. And I've spent a lot of time with all of them. BPF trace, okay, I've got BPF trace at the top. F trace, I keep moving down towards the right because it keeps adding capabilities. And we saw earlier with synthetic events how you can record variables and refer to them and then come up with custom latency distributions. That's great. I think it's actually making the F-Trace interface harder to use, which is why F-Trace really needs a higher level interface. And that's and the SQL style interface is one of them. And so as F-Trace, if we get a higher level interface that works, F-Trace can make a detour and turn left and start moving up to the 
easier end of this diagram. BPF Trace, at the moment, it's, it's looking great, 0 0.9.2, we just launched. And I began with BPF back with raw BPF and CBPF, which are really, really hard to use. And so over time, we've been adding the easier front end. I've spent a lot of this year writing a book on BPF performance tools, and that shows what we can do with tracing capabilities. I discussed this in the iAdvisor meeting at the end of 2017, that we needed a book. It's a great way to share everything things can do. Internally at Netflix, this is a way for me to scale my skills, because I, I've given copies to all the other developers so they can self-study. And this is also becoming the basis of an internal Netflix course that I can teach instructor-led. But there was another reason as well, and that was at that point, we'd published a lot of documentation, especially myself and Sasha Goldstein, on how to use BPF and various BPF tracing. And sooner or later, someone is going to throw it together and put together a book. And on one hand, that would have been OK, because if they threw together what was already published, I wrote a lot of it, so I guess it's OK. But on the other hand, it would be bad because I knew what was missing. So there was a lot of tracing tools I just hadn't done yet and documentation I just hadn't written yet. So if at the end of 2017 you took together what was published on BPF tracing and, and put it together and stuck it on Amazon, it would be incomplete. And so creating this book project was an opportunity to fill in the gaps. This diagram of the BPF performance tools, in red are the new tools that I developed for the book. And especially, I had a blind spot for socket tracing. And so I've gone around and added a lot new, created many new tools for socket stuff. But there were gaps all over the place. So it's really great to have this finished. It will be, the electronic version is on Safari right now. Uh, all the tools are open source on GitHub. I published the repo this morning, actually while I was sitting here in, the, in Plumbers. And the physical paper book should be out definitely by the end of the year. It's a big book. It's 750 pages. So it takes them a while to do copy edit and layout. So I'd expect a couple of months. Just as a quick example of what sort of things the tools can do. So I wrote a tool for read ahead. Just it was on my to-do list for many years so that I can find out is the read ahead algorithm actually performing well or not. And then print out, after I've read, read in pages, so file system read ahead or prefetch, what's the age of the page when I use it? Because if they use quickly, it means the read ahead algorithm is working well. If they're very old by the time they're used, maybe read ahead was too aggressive. And also to do a count of unused pages. So you can have an idea of like, I would like, th there's this algorithm in the kernel, this algorithm in the application. Is it working well or not? What's the ideal tool that would give me that information? And then you can code it in so few lines of code that it fits on a slide. There's the BPF trace program for that where I'm just tracing from K probes to do my accounting. So lots of tools like that, really lots of great use cases for performance analysis filling in observability gaps. Discussion. As part of writing the book, I hit many brick walls where BPF, BPF trace in particular couldn't do something. And so with help from the community and Alistair and people in this room, we went and added those capabilities just so that I could get the tools written. And so getting to the end of the book is a huge milestone, not just for the book, but for BPF Trace and its own capabilities, because we we're able to get all the tools to work. But in getting those tools to work, I often had to use K-probes when I kind of should have used trace points, because trace points would be much more stable. At the top of the list of desired trace points would be VFS would really like VFS trace points. VFS read and write, it would be fantastic. Can expose arguments. Yes, someone else would like them as well. That, I, yeah, you <laughs> don't even need to say anything. I put the words in your mouth. Go ahead. Talk to Al Firo. Uh, yeah. He's the one against it. Uh, one thing is we may not be able to, well, trace events, we may not be able to get trace points possibly if that's okay, there's a difference. If are you familiar with the difference? Uh, tra trace event. Uh, trace. You told me before. Yeah. Yes. But trace events say, is what say you again see. for the room and my memory. Okay. Uh, trace events are what you see in a 
TraceFS file system. Uh, when you do a create a trace event, you get the whole, here's the format, here's the fields, this. A trace point is actually the hook in the kernel. It's, it's the trace events are built on top of trace points. When you create a trace event, you create a trace point. But if you, hold on a but if you make a trace point, um, it will not create a trace event. And the reason why Albiro is afraid of trace events is because it exposes the uh, inter that uh, data goes to user space, and he's afraid that Linus is going to be very, you know, if someone built a tool on top of something from VFS, and then they want to change something, and they remove that trace point, and that tool breaks, next thing you know, um, Linus rejects that change. So Albiro is very, very much against adding any trace events into the um, VFS layer. But if we could get them to we get trace points, which means that they're not stable, so it's the whole thing, like, yes, they're more stable, they're there, but they're not guaranteed to be there in the future. That, that ship is sailed. Like, yes. we already had a TCP set state trace point. I wrote tools that used it. It was then deleted. It was added in 4.6 and deleted in 4.7. So I'm okay with trace points being best effort. And I said this at LSFMM as well. I'm okay with trace that points was trace, being... That was a trace event. Not even a trace point, was it? That was a trace event. That was what? a trace point that was added and removed. So I'm saying, was it, was it exposed by the trace of process? It was exposed. It was That's exposed. a trace event. There's a difference. That's what I'm saying. Okay. The trace event is what's exposed. Trace points are just the hook. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Yep. Linus is flat out saying it's okay to change. Wait. Yes. He, Linus has said. Um, yeah. You said Linus has said he, it's okay if they change. No. He basically said, yeah, they're changed as long as they don't break anything like PowerTop. That's really useful. Not true. <laughs> No, no, Steven, like... Where is he? Let's what? Raise your hand. So... There like he is. Yeah, we will have this to, argument if you, again. if you want to have to ask this... You asked this question already many times, and Linus many times clarified. It is okay Well, Linus will be here them. tomorrow. Yes, so... So let's so, sit down and ask so, him. Sure, okay. Let's do it again. But yes, like, that's talk. been already, talk. like, mentioned many times. There were all WN articles written about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, this done. Like, you can change them. We had this point. They were exposed. We had trace point, trace event, everything. We removed them. Yeah, but the we changed them. Like Salinas has said, you know, user does does user space break? We break user space all the time. Yes. But it's the old thing. If no one notices, did it really break? No, we did break. And Brandon fixed his yeah, you're, tool you're lucky because that you have we changed that the trace point. No, no, no you're not getting the, the point. Top. Someone it complained is to okay. <laughs> it's well, like like anyone can complain as much as they can, but. It is okay to change well, I guess them. The, the trace the point can change them, we will change that's why them. We're, those that got screwed by PowerTop are afraid to change, that's why. But yeah, well actually, well, I want this guy to talk who's been very patient. I wanted to add to this uh, issue trace event, trace points, one data point, which is uh, the PEL trace point that are going to appear in 5.3 are going to be of this new kind. They don't expose the trace event they uh, only uh, have a trace point, and Peter Zelstra posed this as a condition to get those very useful uh, uh, trace point in the scheduler code. Yes, I'm familiar with that. Yeah, so the, uh, I think, I don't know if it's the first case of trace points without tra is, is post trace event. It, I don't remember any other example, but this thing is uh, uh, yeah. taking some momentum, I guess. Yeah, we'll talk about more of that later. Okay, thanks. VFS, wasn't expecting it to be that controversial, but yes, we need to get <laughs> VFS in. <laughs> socket send receive, I use, this, I use socket tracing a lot. And these are I, things that were born out of writing the 750 page book. Socket send receive, it's nice to trace network IO at the socket level because you're still in process context so I can rely on the process ID. I'm using TCP send message, receive message, uh, there's a socket operations type with other, other things you might need to trace as well. SKB alloc would be nice to have a trace point because we actually already have SKB, consume SKB, and k-free SKB. So the use case there is doing the lifespan of SKBs inside the kernel, which gets complicated for a number of reasons, like splitting SKBs and coalescing SKBs, but at least I want to try. <laughs> I want to try to do this. TCP send receive. Of course, as soon as we add TCP send receive, as soon as we have TCP trace point heaven, all workloads will move over to UDP. I've experienced this many times as a performance engineer. As soon as you fix frame pointers and symbols for one target, everyone's using something else. <laughs> so we will need to get UDP done as well. There's some trace points we can add that should be uncontroversial. 
like IP ECN, explicit congestion notification, it would be nice to have trace points for that. Gen L, uh, by queue limits, some trace points, it would be nice to uh, add information to them. The block trace points don't have a unique ID, and I'd like a unique ID so that I can trace latency from the start of a block IO to the end of a block IO, instead of having to add the sector ID and the device ID and other stuff, and locks. Yes. Hello. Um, just um, what's your views on, um, t I think we badly need something like a synthetic provider framework, like, you know, IO starts, SCED on CPU, that kind of thing, like we used to have in another world. Yeah, what's your view on that? Because a lot of this is point stuff. You're saying, you know, VFS providers. I'd like to see, you know, like IO start, for example, and you export to me an argument which is fully populated with typed information. That kind of thing, like it used to have in DFACE. So there seem to be two parts of it. Mm. There's the, the group of trace points, which is already done, so Linux has that. They're called categories or systems, depends on the documentation you read. So like the SKB group, and then you've got the SKB trace points. And then there is having a standard struct that the trace point exposes. And it's possible we could do that at the moment if you have a look in sysfs tracing debug, you do get the members, I'm sure you're familiar with this, you get the members for each of the trace points. Yeah. Just from a usability perspective, it's, you know, it's just really nice not having to decipher all that information, just have a common format. Um, you know, it's a really nice thing. You need some translation framework. Yeah, so. it's, it's an idea I haven't thought about. I yeah. mean, the, the way Linux does it is we can just add, a, What's the difference between that and adding a list of members to a trace point? Each of them have their own names. I, I don't care how it's done. It's just um, it would be nice to have a unified, a higher level, you know, um, probe. Yeah, because the mo at the moment we sort of are there, because you can take a, s a set of trace points and you can and you can develop them to say make sure they always have these five common members. And basically, what you're saying is, well, that should be a struct, and then make sure they all have a struct. Indeed, yeah. But we can sort of do the same thing right now to make sure that those trace points have the same five members, they have the same names, so you, it's almost the I same thing. Yeah, I, mean, I get what, I get what, you're, what you're suggesting. Yeah. It's an easy of use thing, but that's really important. Like you say, e the easiest it is to use, then people will actually use it. So. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's just a different model from what we've got right now, which mm. is you look at the named arguments and you use them. BPF helpers, so some that would be desired if you see some of these and you'd like to work on them, go ahead. Struct file the path name, like path lookup at. This came up a, a lot because I can easily give you the, the file name itself or walk to its parent directory, but I want the full path name, the full absolute path, and we should just have a helper for that. A lot of times I'm tracing at the syscall level or close to the syscall level and I have file descriptor integers and I'd like some helpers to turn them into the struct file or the path name or the file type, like whether it's a SOC or, or different file types themselves. There's a big problem emerging with BPF get current com exposes the thread name and applications are starting to set their thread names more than they used to. When I first started using BPF at Netflix, a lot of my tools print out the com the name of the process, and that would say Java. Sounds good. In the middle of writing the book, there's, there's been updates to Java and updates to applications, and so now the production workloads we have, each of the thread names are different. So you have the C2 compiler threads, the application threads, and they all have separate names. And so my examples changed, and it's, it's at the point where it's like, well, now I need the actual parent name. I need to see Java as well as the thread names. And so we just need to add a helper for that should be straightforward so that we get the parent or process name, not just the thread name or task name. There's more than just the single uh, get insects that we have in the kernel. There's lots of other timestamps as well. I would like all the timestamps, the kernel tracks, give them to me because I'll find a use for them. So the CPU time, we need to add a helper for fetching that. There's time stamps for scheduler accounting, delay accounting, all sorts of time stamps. So why do I want all the time stamps? Imagine you can uprobe an application request, so when it begins and ends, and then I can break it down into time spent waiting on the run queue, time spent waiting on disk IO, time spent waiting on 
all these things. That's the marriage of application context and kernel context that makes this tracing worthwhile. Because if I try and sell tracing to application developers, they already have custom tracing tools often for the application, which are pretty good. They have all these custom things. So why, why would they want to go and use a kernel tracer? You want to use it because the kernel has extra information and you want to marry it with the application context. And so all those timestamps are an example of extra information. It's so easy to fetch the timestamp when you enter an application request and when you finish, what happens, provided you're on the same task, the thread ID, so would be great. More string functions we might, might need. I just wanted to add that to the slide. Bigger capabilities, BTF, thanks to Yun Sung, we've already got BTF there. Unprivileged BTF, we've been discussing, so that's something that we need for some environments. Probe multi-attach, at the moment if I try to BPF trace a hundred probes, you can notice how slow it is to start and stop. F trace is really fast in comparison, so I use ftrace for, for a lot of function counting tasks. Ftrace, of course, is cheating because f entry is built into the function, compiled into all the functions, so it doesn't need to go and modify things. But we, it would be nice to have multi-attach. We've mentioned this before, someone just needs to do the work. Faster u probes, we've mentioned before. LTTNG has its method, which is super fast <laughs> compared to what we're doing. So some integration of that. Uh, and we need to get ready for the BPF probe read and the read user and kernel split that will eventually happen. So BPF probe read will, in order to support other architectures like Spark that have a different address space for user and kernel which can overlap, we need to have that split up. Yes, box, speaking box. Uh, for the LTTNG style fast uh, U-probes, are you talking about the LTTNG kernel tracer U-probe integration or the native LTTNG user space only tracer? Uh, I believe I'm talking about the user space only okay. tracer. That's the fastest, yeah. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's some way of leveraging that from, I know it's gonna be very strange because it runs in its own world, but some way of marrying the information that it can get with the information we get from the kernel. That's what we're trying to work on. And the, the final thing I had here is what are the biggest challenges we have right now? Off-CPU analysis is something I want to do a lot more of. Off-CPU analysis is where I, I generally consider CPU analysis a solved problem. I can do timer-based stack sampling. I can look at PMCs and look at instructions for cycle and I can decompose it into stall cycles. So you give me a CPU bound workload and I can answer it very well. Lots of workloads are off CPU bound, we're blocked on locks, we're blocked on IO. How do I decompose that? Well, I can trace schedule events, we've got trace points for it. I can look at when we block. I can look at who woke up the blocking thread and their stack trace. I can look at who woke up the waker and so on. I can do all these great things, but I need the stack traces for the context. And unfortunately, a lot of blocking events go through select or poll or fread or write, and that's all in libc, and libc is universally shipped without the frame pointer. And so it breaks, I've got a flame graph here where we've got pthread con time wait and there's nothing underneath, and I see this all the time at Netflix. We've been automating flame graphs, automating BPF-based flame graph collections, so you click a button, you get an off CPU flame graph. Great, it's broken, <laughs> but it's showing it to you. And it's broken because we have no user level stack trace because we all die on libc. So at Netflix, do we build our own libc and then ship that? This is a challenge we're dealing with right now. There's another Netflix engineer here in the distros track trying to figure that out. Do we talk to the maintainers of, of glibc and say, you need to compile this differently or the distro maintainers? Uh, one solution is use LBR, use last branch record, because you can then walk past the places where you don't have frame pointers, where deployed on the cloud, and the cloud usually disables a lot of processor features, and so LBR is something I don't have access to on the cloud. Uh, do you do? I think this is um, 
I think the reason why they don't do flame pointers is because there is added overhead when you have frame pointers compiled in. Yeah, I'd like to benchmark that though. Uh, it, it really depends. In the production applications we've benchmarked, the frame pointer overhead is almost always close to 0.1%. Okay, because in the kernel, we, when we did it for kernel, we saw about closer to 4%. Four, 4%. Yeah, I'd love to know what, what I'd love to see a cycle, cycle breakdown of the 4%. But that was 2007, things might have changed. Never 2007, know. things might have changed. The worst I've saw, we have one production workload at Netflix where the frame pointer, you know, Java frame pointers was 10% overhead. 10%, I'd love to see a cycle breakdown to find out why, but um, we don't have PEBS on the cloud, precise event-based sampling, so I can't actually reliably do cycle-based analysis. So I'd love to know what that 10% was. I do know one thing that the, it involved stack traces of 1,000 frames deep. Is there, is there a reason you didn't use more speed? So the question was, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question, can, can I not use dwarf for going past libc? At the moment we don't have dwarf access from BPF. Plus I, don't, I believe dwarf, the dwarf stack trace walking, well, we've got um, debug info installed on a lot of instances, but I believe that was designed for a breakpoint based debugger and not a real time debugger like BPF. And so the overhead, like what if you have to page fault in some of the dwarf information while you in the in a probe context? That Do we like have ORC work. for user space? Are you familiar with ORC? ORC. ORC. Yeah, that's what we said. ORC. Yes, so so did I put it on the slide? I should have put it on the slide. So we should have ORC for user space. We should get there's some GCC people here. We should get ORC. By default, put into GCC. And you know, by the way, that's the ORC maintainer. Thank you, sir. <laughs> your, your, your task is to talk to the, G, if the GCC person's here, that'll be great. And then ORC everywhere, all applications have ORC. And then, because we already, BPF already accesses ORC because it goes, as Stephen showed me, it goes through the same perf stack trace walker. So it's got ORC support already. Yeah. Uh, if we can generate the ORC information out of Dwarf, one thing that could be perhaps be done if we want to move a distribution to have added ORC information would be to go over all the debug info and generate that ORC uh, info uh, as a post-processing step. Yeah, you could convert Dwarf to ORC. Yeah, I mean, you can convert Dwarf to ORC. We don't have tools to do that now, but it, it should be pretty, pretty easy to do. This is, this is, that's it. Okay, so, <laughs> right. 